today I'm speaking with Leanne Miller. Leanne, thank you so much for joining me today. Yeah, of course. And Leanne is from San Antonio, Texas, but lives uh, now in the north part of Dallas, Texas. And she went to the University of North Texas. So a lot of Texas stuff there. What's it like living in Texas, by the way? Do you like that whole climate and the atmosphere? No, it's <laughs> hot. Um, when I moved to Dallas, it was a little nicer. We get we get some snow up here sometimes, which is nice. But no, if I could go like six more hours up into like the Ozark Mountains, that would be like the sweet spot for me. I think. Yeah, we um we have something similar here in Atlanta where it's 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 very hot and humid a lot of the time. But yeah, and Leanne is married and they have a cat. And she's also a personal stylist and wedding photographer, which is really cool. I'm, I'd love to pick your brain sometime about that, just in terms of your style of doing that and the different tools you use to get that done, uh, both with the cameras and the editing software. Um, yeah. She's also an aspiring writer. We might touch on that in the interview. And she's going to write about her own life as well as various religious topics. She grew up in Pentecostalism and the Southern Baptist denomination, but she did deconvert during the pandemic, which we'll get into later. And she's just recently shared her deconversion with loved ones. But we have a whole whole background to get before we get into those details. So at this point, I'd love to, you know, first, before we actually get into your story, I'd love to hear something just fun about yourself. Do you have any hobbies you could tell us about? Yeah, um, I just recently started collecting uranium glass. I'm not sure if you know what that is. Um, no. Yeah, uranium glass is a, it's a green glass that like glows under a black light. Um, it was really popular, like in the forties and fifties. Um, and it's, it's just really neat glass. And I started, it's a very like mid-century, um, modern and it's just, uh, it's a kind of fun thing to go to thrift shops and, um, vintage stores and try to find things from older years. Very cool. Yeah. I used to like, I don't know if it's, if I'd really like it, but I love the color of that, um, jadeite, the green jadeite, mm -hmm. you know, yeah, the yeah that's the color of my kitchen. I love that color. Yeah. Yeah. My grandma had all those bowls when I was, whenever I'd visit her. Well, I'd, I'd love to hear your story then at this point. Um, feel free to take us back as early as you remember. We love to kind of hear everything that kind of shaped your worldview. Um, not just, you know, what you were taught, but also just your personal experiences and your private life with it all. So feel free to tell us whatever's on your mind. Yeah. So I grew up with my my mother grew up um, in Pentecostalism. She was um, adopted by a family who um, a lady who kind of like in her teens went to a church revival and that's when she started believing. Um, and then my and then my mom pretty much grew up that way. And they were definitely the type of Pentecostal where it was like jeans, skirts. We don't wear makeup. We don't wear ear. Uh, you know, we don't wear uh, earrings or jewelry. Um, so that's how she grew up. Um, and she pretty much her whole life had the fear of going to hell because, um, she was, she never spoke in tongues. Now that is like a, a tenant of Pentecostalism is in order to be saved, you have to be able to speak in tongues. Hmm. So that's how she grew up. And she shared those stories with me as a child. So I grew up learning, um, about her experiences in the church um, and seeing, seeing what happened there. Um, and then my father was kind of a military brat. And so his father, they, um, they traveled around a lot. Um, they were in Tennessee and Kentucky and they moved to Germany. So he didn't really have a stable church life, but they were kind of more involved in more Southern Baptist type of stuff. Um, you know, my grandpa built like a Southern Baptist church, I believe in Tennessee or something like that. So he assisted with that and I grew up my whole life around um, Christianity, and it wasn't around until maybe when I was in kindergarten um, that my family found a house that, um, and we we moved into a house. We were no longer like living in an apartment, and uh, my dad got a stable job uh, working for the government, and then my parents decided that they wanted to find you know a church home. And so Can I ask with your mom, did she ever speak in tongues to get over that issue? No, she was never able to speak in tongues. Um, and she grew up, she had several other siblings and she had a brother who was able to speak in tongues. Um, and her brother, you know, she, I remember her telling me stories about like, you know, I just wasn't able to understand, you know, 
why he was able to speak in tongues because, you know, he was like kind of like a bad kid, you know, he was m- much more rebellious and he, you know, was mean and would tease people. And, you know, I didn't do any of those things. And I prayed to God every night and I was never able to receive the gift of speaking in tongues. Um, so yeah, she definitely grew up with that fear. And I mean, from a young, you know, young age, I realized like, oh, that's a terrible thing for a child to like cry themselves to sleep at night and think that they're going to hell because they can't speak in tongues. So did she, is she still in that, uh, mentality that she's still in danger of not being saved? I don't think so. Um, I, she believes it's still a gift that you can, you can get that. Um, but she believes she doesn't she no longer believes that it's a necessary requirement in order to get to heaven hmm. so um that's a crazy story though it's <laughs> amazing yeah so but when i was a child i think because of her experience with that i think because of how hard that was for her she decided that she didn't want to have me grow up in those types of churches but she really did miss the um the charisma the charismatic type of churches um you know where people take their shoes off and run around the church and do those types of things um she missed the music she missed stuff like that um and so and while my dad was not really into that that was like a little too much for him um we started kind of going to more like baptist non-denominational type of churches um however when i was eight i ended up um her family lives in west virginia and they're all pentecostal um upc four square denomination those types and um, those are oneness pentecostal branches meaning um, the doctrine of oneness would be uh, when you get baptized you get baptized in jesus name not the trinity um uh, so they make that distinction. And so when I was maybe like eight or something, eight or nine, maybe I accepted Christ and I um, got saved and got baptized at one of those churches. Um, so I was baptized in a Pentecostal church first. And um, yeah, I remember that experience um, you know, being able to like, I ended up sewing my baptismal dress, you know, I got really into it. Um, I really liked the movie of brother Ralph though. So I ended up choosing <laughs> like one of the songs, the let's go down in the river to pray song. Um, it was a really small church, so it wasn't one of these big, um, baptism experiences. It was like maybe two people were up there. So, you know, I kind of got to be a lot more involved um and like planning those types of things uh, like picking the music out um and so that was when i was really young can i ask when when you were going through those kind of experiences Mm -hmm. was there a clear message that you recall about how to actually be saved or was it just kind of going through the motions because everyone else was doing it like what was it like in terms of your actual beliefs about what you're doing Um, yeah, I mean, it was, uh, as far as the beliefs, as far as how to be saved, it was the saying the sinner's prayer, um, acknowledging that you're a sinner, um, and that Christ, um, died and rose for your sins and only through his bloodshed can you be saved. Um, so, and then, um, the repentance, uh, repentance of putting your old life behind you and turning to Christ, um, and placing your faith and trust in him um, and having him enter your life. That was, that's how to be saved um, in that scenario. And with that denomination, there are some Pentecostal denominations where um, you're saved, you're baptized, and then you speak in tongues. Like some people like expect you to like automatically start speaking in tongues, like as soon as you're baptized. Um, I don't believe that was one of those churches because I certainly never spoke in tongues. Um, but you know, my, my grandmother did, my uncles did, uh, the people in the church did, but I never did. And we didn't visit that church a whole lot. It was like every couple of years we would go up there. We would spend like maybe a month with my grandma or a week with my grandma and we would go to the church and she was heavily involved. So it wasn't just like 
one Sunday out of the week, it was, you know, Wednesday service and Thursday service and Sunday morning service and Sunday night service. <laughs> so, um, and then my uncle also, he, um, he worked for the church. He did like a lot of audio visual work for another Pentecostal church, um, in the area. So, you know, I would go to like VBS, you know, with their church, um, as a child and do that type of thing. Hmm. Do you remember the first time you actually pr prayed the sinner's prayer, what that experience was like? Um, no, I don't remember that. I remember the baptism more than anything. Um, yeah. And there's a funny story with that because that's not the first time I get baptized. <laughs> so, uh, yeah, fast forward to I'm like 12 or 13 now where we have moved we like kind of lived closer to san antonio at that point at this and when i was 12 or 13 we moved a little farther north and we started going to a um this is like our first official church home um we started going to a country church um and a country church is they're mostly non-denominational, but a lot, um, many of them will have like Southern Baptist roots. Um, and they are, their whole thing is come as you are, you know, you can wear your jeans and your cowboy boots and nobody's going to judge you. You know, you don't have to dress up or anything like that. And, you know, they don't usually like send around offering plates. They leave that kind of stuff at the door. So you walk in. So they just want to keep it more casual and re relax, essentially. Um, but we started going to one of these churches and I, you know, got involved, pretty heavily involved. I was dating the youth minister's son. Um, so I was pretty involved by once again, going on Wednesdays, you know, on youth services, going to women's Bible studies with my mom and going on Sundays to Sunday school and church. So we were, we were pretty heavily involved with that. Um, we went to, or I went to youth camp, uh, maybe like three or four times while I was going to that church. And I want to say it was the first time I went, um, they were definitely putting on like the emotional, um, you know, stirring up the emotions during the services. Um, I have no clue what type of, you know, music they were playing, but like whatever, like pop Christian music was really hip at the time. And um, really emphasizing the whole like Jesus died for your sins. Um, they had a part in the service where I remember where we had to like write our sins on like this post-it note or this paper. And then we had to like go up to this big cross that, we, that they had and nail our sins to the cross. Like as if we were driving the nails through the hands of Jesus because yeah. we essentially did. Like that's what they taught. <laughs> Mm -hmm. so that's a little bit of a guilt trip if i've ever heard one well wow. yeah so a guilt um, trip for for torturing some a mythological figure from 2000 yes. ago. that's just crazy yeah so um at the time there there were a lot of emotions going through my head not just with that but i was an emotional teenager i was in like my first relationship um, you know, and I was dealing with all of that stuff there at the church, um, and maybe like <laughs> and all that, all that stuff was going on. So, um, I got saved there and, you know, they talk about like the highs of when you go to church youth camp, or if you go on missionary tri uh, trips, um, you get on these high highs of really being involved in the word and being committed. And they tell, you know, like when you go back home, you're going to be excited for a couple of weeks and then it's going to go die down and you're going to go back to your, you know, your old ways. And I said, the sinner's prayer, I did all those things there. And then the youth pastor, you know, told me like, all right, well now you have to get baptized. And I was like, okay, not thinking that like I was in the moment in my high, high, not thinking, wait, I've already been baptized, <laughs> you know, had no thoughts of it. Didn't, didn't even consider that. 
And so when I came back home from the trip, I was so excited. And I, I told my mom, I was like, mom, I got saved. You know, I'm telling her all this stuff. I'm going through like all the notes that I had written in my like Bible and my study group or, you know, for the study, different study groups that we had had there. And she's like, what are you talking about? You're already saved. And I was like, no, 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 I was just baptized before. And she was like, no, you have to be saved. And then you're baptized. Like you said, the sinner's prayer the baptism is a reflection, you know, your outward expression that you have been saved. And I was clearly too young to understand at eight and nine what I was doing because, you know, like I said, I was like, I, I didn't really remember that process. I remember the process of sewing my dress and, you know, thinking this is a white dress. I'm going to be in water. It's going to be see through. <laughs> like worrying about those things, worrying about the music. Like that's where my head was at. Um, you know, and yeah, so it was very interesting to come back and not, and I felt very let down because I was so excited that I had been saved and my mom was not very excited about this. Was there any sense, do you think that she had, might've been thinking she had let you down by not being more serious about your eternal state all that time? Yeah, I think, I think she... You know, she might have thought, you know, did we, I, she was confused because she was like, you know, we sat you down, we talked to you about these things, asking you if you understood and you said yes. And I'm like, I, I don't remember any of that. And honestly, I'm too young to remember like anything from those years. Like maybe I did say those things, but I don't know. Like, I, I don't know. Like, this is what I remember of it. I don't really remember being saved or like having these convictions. But I grew up believing that I'm a sinner. Sinners go to hell. Like, I believed that, like, my whole life, even before we were going to, like, a regular church or anything like that. So I guess I never made the connection. Like, what's the point of, like, believing all of those things and believing the stories which I've been believing and have been told, like, you know, since first being able to, like, being, being given, like, a child's uh, Bible, you know, like what what's really the difference i didn't i guess i didn't quite understand that <laughs> so. mm -hmm. did you have a sense at all in those intermediate years between the two baptisms that you might have been um they might have been saying something like you you may have been already saved but you now you need to get really serious about the lord or or he's king he's the ruler but you might be acting like he's not you need to let him rule because he already is the ruler you know stop in a sense taking his his seat his throne did you ever look back on it and think that at the time that and think you were just kind of rededicating your life to the lord did you did you feel like as a teenager like that was actually your real salvation moment yeah definitely as a as a teen i felt like well you know like that didn't be, i guess because i wasn't able to even remember the, the younger years i was like well this that wasn't real um yeah. you know um and i felt i put much more weight on my experience as a teen maybe because i was just able to remember it better and i was able to process and i had i certainly was a lot more emotional around that time and felt like guilt <laughs> you know felt those types of things um and i think i understood more and we were becoming way more involved in church than we ever were so um yeah in a, in a way a rededication but more about like being much more involved in the church than I ever was. Mm. What was your private devotional like life with Jesus? What did you do when when you were just by yourself? I mean, from I mean, from the age that I first got baptized, uh, like probably all the way up into eighteen, it was definitely like every night you have to say you know prayers. You have to, um, you know, like it's it's really interesting to. Um, you know, the whole, I lay myself down to sleep. I pray the Lord my soul to take. If I die before I wake, I pray the Lord my soul to keep. Like I said that every single night, even after I was baptized, which doesn't really make a lot of sense <laughs> because it's like, well, if you believe you're going to heaven, if you've been saved, there's no reason to ask for that. It's, it's pretty Catholic in a way, in the sense of like, you're repenting of your sins and you're um, you know, like asking Christ to like, hey, remember me if I die tonight. <laughs> yeah, yeah, very much a kind of a works worksy salvation thing. It's yeah. it's interesting the whole dynamic of of needing to kind of 
fear that you might lose it. And I know some groups yeah. are much stronger in their theology about like, no, no, you definitely can't. You're like, you're not going to lose it if you're secure in Christ. But there mm-hmm. is, even for those of us who grew up with that mentality, it's amazing how there's this sense of like, you still need to stay so close or just bad things are going to happen. Either, you know, God's going to get you, there, you know, there's verses that say, don't be deceived. God's not mocked. Whatever you sow, you'll reap. Mm-hmm. And, you know, in the Old Testament, there's a lot of stuff from for, from God to Israel about, you know, if you obey me, I'll bless you. But if you don't obey me, I'll curse you. And the curses will be very bad. Um, I mean, right. na- nasty stuff. And so you do get this sense of like, even if you get saved, technically you could still ruin your life by not doing it right. And it, right. especially when you add in like angels and demons, like there's ways in which they could mess you up and certainly your own sin nature and your you know hormones as a teenager, and you end up in a spot where you definitely feel like, even though, even if you theologically say this is purely by grace alone, faith alone, right? you just feel like you're living a work salvation in some ways, if you know what I mean. Yes. Yeah. I, I relate to that. Hmm. So just curious too, when you were at that point, like in my words, on fire for the Lord, you're excited, mm-hmm. you got saved. Did you feel more compulsion to start sharing your faith with other people? And how did that play out in, in missions trips and things like that? Yeah. So I never went on any missions trips. Um, I de- We did have like outreach programs where if people came to our church, they filled out cards. You know, if you're new to the church, fill out the card. And the youth group, what they would do is they would get one boy, one girl, one man, one woman, adults or for adult supervision. And then they would like drive us around to like maybe four or five houses, whatever. Um, you know, and they would send us out to basically go talk to those people, say like, oh, you know, thanks for coming to our church. What did you think about it? And basically it was trying to, um, you know, a lot of times people would like let us come into their house and we would sit down with them and we would kind of like ask them about like where they were and their walk with the Lord, if they were saved, those types of things, um, and give them the opportunity to like say the sinner's prayer and get saved, you know, that day. And, you know, do you understand today? If you're not saved, you're going to hell if you die tonight, you know, like those types of things. So um, I did participate in some of those, but On my own, I felt very strange about um, proselytizing to other people um, because it was not lost on me, even as a young adult, that the reason I was Christian was because I grew up in a Christian household. And the reason someone's Mormon is because they grew up in a Mormon household. And the reason someone's Hindu is because they grew up in a Hindu household. And, you know, it did not make a lot of sense to me that a whole group of people would be going to hell just because they did not believe in the right God. So I struggled with that a little bit, but then in the same, the same vein, I would, I had Catholic friends and I definitely brought several Catholic friends to church camp and told them, you know, like, you're not really saved. You know, we didn't believe that they were really Christians (laughs) in the same way that we were Christians. Yeah, you because know, of Mary and you know the Mary veneration, the saint veneration, we kind of looked at it as like other idols and stuff like that. Yeah, for sure. But, they yeah. have had to have the gospel right. Right. Um, with with that dynamic of you kind of questioning how to relate to people who are, like you said, grew up in a different religion or denomination, and just the sense of your your message is implying an attack. And saying your worldview is in, in, insufficient, it's wrong, it's erroneous, it's it's damning. Did you feel like you were in a like spot to ever share it, or like how did you overcome that? Because, like for example, for me, I well, I'm sure I saw that same um, dynamic, mm-hmm. but I was just like, you got to get them saved. And I remember um, telling a, as a young kid, I remember telling a, another Catholic girl that we would play with that she was on the way to hell. And yeah. I remember it began a big deal because her parents came and talked to my parents like, <laughs> going in the to world? Hell. <laughs> like your, your kid's going to tell my kid and scare this stuff. But my dad, I think was like in a bad spot because he was, he was trying to be very friendly with this family. But at the same time, when he and I spoke privately later, I was like, yeah, I can, if you want me to stop saying something, I'll stop saying something. Of course I'll obey. But like, isn't it true that she's on the way to hell? He's like, yeah, yeah it is true. But we're not going to, I was like, well, so we're not going to say it. 
mm-hmm. even though it's the most important thing that they really need to hear. You know, kind of yeah. like if, if you really love someone, you'll tell them the truth. You won't hide it from them. And it it definitely it's, it's a weird spot to be, especially as a kid, because you're dealing with both. You have to obey when they say don't 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 talk about it. But yet, you know, in your heart, you have to talk about it because this, you know, kids aren't guaranteed life that, you know, mm-hmm. a child could die, too. And she needs to be saved. And it's it's a very weird dynamic. How did you overcome it? Yeah, well, I think I definitely bought into like the big lie of Christians are so prosecuted, like even in America, like I, I really believe that. Uh, when I was younger. And so I think I was a little bit more scared to evangelize. Mind you, there were no um, campus crusaders for any other religion (laughs) in any of the schools that I went to. Um, I went to public schools where they, you know, I had a health teacher who did something that like you'd probably see a youth pastor do where they get a white piece of paper and they say, all right, go around the room, take a piece, rip it up. All right. If you lose your virginity, this is basically what's left of you as a person, you know, and I had that happen in a public school. So the concept and I, you know, of course, definitely having science teachers that were not willing to talk about evolution. (laughs) You know, I had that. Um, so, but I bought into that lie and I think I was maybe a little fearful to share. And so I thought the best way to handle that was like, um, you know, that I have to like let Christ's mercy and his goodness shine through me. That's the best way. If they see that I'm a decent person, if I'm treating people right, they'll, they'll ask, you know, what is it about her that is so different than other people? Um, and that I would be able to invite them, you know, I had no problem, like, if I made friends with someone telling them that, you know, like, I went to youth group, and I went to this church, you know, and inviting them. And I did that with several friends. Um, And my parents even let me go to other friends' churches. I had several Mormon friends. I had gone to their churches and kind of saw how they did, did things. I had gone to friends' churches who were Catholic and kind of seen those things. And I invited all those friends to, um, to youth camps and stuff like that. So, but as far as telling people outright that, Hey, I think you're going to hell. (laughs) No, I, I was not doing that. And part of me, I don't know if, I don't know if I ever truly believed that. I think I had more of like a universalist idea that maybe we're all technically somehow praying to the right God and God knows their hearts. Like if they're a good person, once again, like I grew up in religions that it was like grace through faith in Christ is your only way of salvation. But I kind of believe very Catholic, like in the sense of like, uh, you know, works. Like if you're a decent person, Hey, you might get in, <laughs> you know? That's interesting. I, 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 I don't think I'd ever went to that particular mental spot with it, but I did wonder when you, when you add in the things like the probability theologically as a Christian that you would see babies who who died just going straight to heaven. And of course, people that had no mental capacity where, you know, they just, they couldn't understand the gospel. They yeah. shouldn't really be culpable for it. Mm-hmm. Think, okay, so they're going to get to heaven. Most likely God's just going to, in his grace, just let them in because, you know, they're not really responsible and all that. And right. you added all, all that stuff up and it, it does, it does kind of, blur the waters a lot but I, I think for me the thing that unblurred them was i was i was neck deep in theologians i was you know i was reading spurgeon and um you know all the old preachers um puritan preachers that were just like you know jonathan edwards sinners in the hands of an angry god like this you have to have the gospel right and right. so i kind of steered away from that but i can see the appeal to it it's it's yeah. it's hard it's hard to deal with that especially when you find people that are just lovely did you know anybody personally that you were like I really hope they get saved soon. Like this is, oh, this is yeah. breaking my heart. I had Mormon friends that like, they were just like the nicest people that I had ever met, hmm. um, you know, and, you know, didn't curse, didn't do anything bad. Um, you know, weren't interested in drinking, had not lost their virginity, you know, versus like the people that I was going to youth group with. I'm like, I knew what they were doing on their weekends. <laughs> and it wasn't, you know, avoiding and abstaining from, you know, all these worldly things like my Mormon friends were. 
Um, so yeah, I definitely, I think the exposure to, um, other religions and being able to go to other churches kind of assisted with me feeling like, I don't really know if, you know, I can, you know, I can agree with something so strict as that same with even just having the contrast in my own family of having a whole side of my family who believe like, um, should it be wearing makeup? Should it be piercing your ears? Um, should it be drinking alcohol? You know, all of those things are sins and you need to turn from sins. If you don't turn from those sins, then that's like an indicator that maybe you're not really saved and that mm. Christ really is not in your heart. And, you know, I saw like, well, my mom, you know, like maybe she'll have a glass of wine every once in a while. I don't think that's going to send her to hell, <laughs> you know. Um, so I think I saw like a disconnect even there and it didn't make sense to me. So I think maybe I was just a little bit more open because I did have, I, I was able to see different religions. Hmm. That's interesting. I, I can definitely relate in, in part, um, a little bit more currently, um, my wife, um, plays this, uh, really cute show for the kids on youtube it's called j house it's just this family but they're a mormon family with five or six kids mm -hmm. and they their their following has grown and so it's a really fun fam like a family type show but because their channel's gotten so big they get a lot of money i'm sure from it so they can just kind of self-perpetuate this thing and just go on trips to the this place and that place and, and video it and, and just grow the channel wow. but they're mormons mm -hmm. and it's an interesting dynamic to me to to just have to deal with that cognitive dissonance of, and I don't, I don't honestly know how Christians do it, mm -hmm. but to be thinking to yourself, they're an awesome family, they're a delight, unless there's like a, you know, this is their, you know, public life, but this is their private life. But if their public and private life match up, they are awesome people that have so much love in their hearts. And to think theologically, my God utterly condemns them. Yeah. And they are, at least the parents are on the way to hell. And it's, it is a crazy thing to have to deal with. And just that pressure of if, if, if you're a good preacher, I mean, in my opinion, if you're a good preacher, um, you're going to tell the truth about what the text says. And yes. the text does not mince words. It says that they're in grave danger. Yeah. And so you have to put yourself in the spot of saying, these are not good people. They're good people in terms of humanity to humans, but the equation is not human to human. The equation is human to God's holiness. Right. And in God's holiness, we all stand condemned according to the Bible. And it's, it's such a hard burden to deal with because you're like, I want to love these people and I want to respect them, but I can't, I can't respect them. And that's another weird thing is you, yeah. you end up completely just saying, I don't care what you believe. It just, it doesn't really matter. You need to listen to my version of everything. And it, it definitely leads to an arrogance. Did you feel like you in the midst of that, did end up getting a chance though, to, to lead anyone to Christ? Despite um, of those issues? Yeah, I think I did. I was able to convert one Catholic friend. <laughs> so, and I, I believe she's still like Christian to this day. Um, I had another Catholic friend that I grew up with. Um, and you know, sh she wasn't super involved in my church, but we had a lot of conversations. Um, and then she eventually like got saved, um, in college and stuff like that. So now she's a Christian. Um, mm. but yeah, I, it, it is really interesting to see that. I think I was just much more open to seeing other things and just not being able to resonate with it um, and feeling like it wasn't just wasn't quite right. And not only that, like the churches that we went to, I really don't feel like now when I look back, um, I think the, the sermons that my parents were getting versus the things that I was getting taught in youth group were very different. Um, it felt like sermons were definitely more just about like the stories and we're going to talk about, you know, this chapter, we're going to read this. Um, and there was a lot more singing and, um, like fellowship versus in the youth groups, there was a lot more like condemning, um, you know, you for your actions or making like, there was a lot more guilt in the youth group. And, even when I talk to my mom now, like I'll talk to her, she's like, Oh, I don't see it that way. It's like, well, we were going to a church that was teaching us these things. Um, you know, and definitely, you know, when I was going to like the youth camps, they were definitely more about, you know, hell and 
you know, talking about those types of things. I remember uh, one of the youth camps that I went to, um, there, they were branching all the kids out and you could go and you can select whatever class you wanted to do. And I selected the, um, I wanted to like really get into the book of revelations. So I selected that book. I knew it was a wacky book. I had read it. That was probably the one that I had read the most of. And I was like, I want to read more about this. And it was about basically like equipping you the tools, um, you know, to, um, to, you know, to have power over Satan. Like that's what this whole, <laughs> um, this whole uh, lesson plan was about. And so for like that whole week, that's the one I went to. And I remember them having like this chanting thing that they would do as far as like, you know, Satan has the power to kill, steal and destroy. And they would just have us all like repeat it. And I just remember like, like looking back on that now, it's like, that sounds so insane. <laughs> just the fear that, um, you know, they really put into all those kids' hearts. Um, so, yeah. That's crazy. It's, it's funny that you've been you're talking about that because I've been reading about um, just some of the books that Jesus quoted from that are what we would call uh, pseudepigrapha or deuterocanonical right. books. And in one of them, there, there's a passage where Jesus talks, that Jesus is accused of, of casting out demons mm -hmm. by the power of Beelzebub. Right. And in that passage, he, he talks for a while, but then he says, he, he references Solomon. And he says, Solomon, you know, the queen of Sheba came to hear all of his wisdom, but a greater than Solomon is here, but it doesn't really make sense as to why bring up Solomon. Just, you know, mm -hmm. did you, did you cast out demons by Beelzebub or not? Mm -hmm. um, are you related, you know, working with Satan or not? What does Satan have to do with it? And why are you greater than him? So I've been reading the the wisdom of Solomon mm -hmm. and you're familiar with that book. I've, I've just been well, um, watching more of the song of solomon that's what i've okay. just been going through <laughs> okay well the wisdom of solomon um it's it's really i'm surprised i hadn't heard too much about it before but basically it's about king solomon mm -hmm. and how he ends up finding out that there are these demons that are doing bad things there in his kingdom and he is able to kind of use a little bit of magic and he gets the the, the archangels to give him power through the through, through the prince of demons, Beelzebub, and Beelzebub is kind of like held captive mm -hmm. by Solomon's magic to be able to do things. But um, Solomon, through Beelzebub, is able to cast out demons. Mm -hmm. And so Jesus then is basically saying, I, "I'm familiar with the story of the wisdom of Solomon, and you know, I know that book, and I'm I'm greater than this this guy. I'm I, you know, if, if Solomon can do it, I can certainly do it." So it's interesting the, the whole dynamic, but you end up when you dive into it a little bit or even to that great extent, you end up with a really weird perspective on it, in my opinion, where you, you're not sure how much to dwell on demons. Cause it seems yeah. like just focus on the gospel. That's all you need. But then other people go really far into it. Like the Frank Preddy books, you know, this present darkness. Mm -hmm. Did you, did you feel like you were afraid of demons all the time? Or like they were in the room with you or like, how did you deal with that whole worldview part of it? All right. Yeah. So when it comes to demons and the presence of demons, I definitely believed in demons. Um, and like I, I told, you know, like I would say like the prayer every night and same thing if I had like watched a scary movie or something like that, you know, I definitely would either open my Bible or I would just like repeat that prayer over and over again. Um, you know, because I was scared, <laughs> you know, I was scared that there were actually demons, um, because of the Pentecostal background on my mom's side, she still believes in demons. Like, even though she has attended more like Baptist type of churches, she believes in demons. Um, you know, that side of the family believes in demons. And I definitely, I definitely did, uh, to us. And I believed, um, you know, you know, like if you're familiar with like the Greg Locke stuff, mm -hmm. I mean, yeah, it, totally in that vein. Did you uh, kind of feel like if you if you were going to plead the blood or plead the name of Jesus that you kind of had some level of protection or just how did you protect yourself against them attacking you? Yeah, um, I, I really took it serious in the sense of I thought having open communication with God, like all day 
like basically praying all day, like whenever you're, you know, when you're not communicating with someone or whatever, you're not busy. You know, if I was like in school and I was walking from, you know, one, um, one class to another, like I was in my head talking to God and praying to God and, you know, like asking for forgiveness if I had like a negative thought or something like that, like all day long. And so, it, yeah, once again, it's once saved, always saved. But there was just some part of me that just felt like, yeah, but re- am I really <laughs> like if I have one negative thought, you know, you're always told that, you know, one day you're going to go before God and you're going to have to account for every bad thing you've done, every bad thought you've ever had you know, all of that's going to flash before your eyes and you're going to have to get account, you know, give account for that. Um, so yeah, I definitely, I believe that. And I had like open communication with God praying all the time. Um, and yeah, when I was pretty much like 13 to like 18, um, that was pretty prevalent in my life. It's, it's interesting that you quoted that verse about, um, the books will be open and you'll be judged. I haven't thought about that in a while, but I, those verses always got me because I thought, but isn't that the point of the gospel right. that the books aren't open? The books are are resolved already by Christ. Right. And it's like for every idle word that you, every idle word that you speak, you'll be judged and the books will be opened. And it's like, wait a second, like, is it Jesus covering it all or not? And it, it did seem like there was this sense of like, you'll never be judged. There's no condemnation for those who are in Christ. And yet many verses clearly saying there's a condemnation or there's at least a judgment that's coming. Mm-hmm. And I think it was always portrayed to us as like, well, it's going to be more about how big your crown is that you get to, to yeah. give to Christ <laughs> as opposed yeah. to like, like whether or not you get in the door or not. But it, it definitely is. It's interesting looking back at it now, of course, you see that, that that's not what's happening. It's that there's mm-hmm. different theological positions being yeah. argued from different angles. But right. um, I was curious with, you mentioned something a few minutes ago. I wanted to come back to the whole ripping up of paper and and virginity and purity culture. Mm-hmm. What is that? What did that look like? What did that mean to you? And how did that play out in your in your worldview? And just did you feel like you were able to thrive in that, or did it, did it hurt you at all? Yeah. Um, so that definitely started to, you know, definitely from a young age. My dad would always say things like, "Oh, you're not allowed to get married till you're 30." You know, like things like that. It was always like putting off any type of like um, relationships or like, um, you know, definitely believe that as soon as you leave your parents' house, you know, you go straight to your husband, Hmm. you know, like from their house, you know, what, from one man's house to another house, (laughs) essentially, like you, you know, no woman is really going to have any like freedom, (laughs) really. Um, you know, the time. Yeah, definitely. You know, and of course, they would have never said anything like that, but they did believe that, you know, you were to remain pure until, um, you know, you got married and you were wed, um, and you weren't supposed to have extramarital affairs or, or be, you know, or have sex outside of marriage. Um, and so the purpose for dating was marriage. And so, um, yeah, I mean, I grew up with that, um, and there was definitely kind of like the whole Josh McDowell thing. It was very trendy for girls to, you know, get the James Avery rings with the cross and the heart and go pick out your purity ring and then, you know, come to church whenever they have like those special events where your dad will like walk you up to the altar and you like basically like... uh that you're going to save yourself till marriage and you promise, you know, some people even like got involved in like writing contracts and stuff like that and doing things like that. Our church did hold those events and the church youth group hold those events. I did not want to do that. <laughs> and I blew it off and told my parents like, uh, you know, I don't really want to ring. You don't need to spend the money. That's just, you know, like that covenant is between me and God. You know, I don't, I don't want to do all that stuff. And part of that was because at 13, I was already dating someone and that was the youth pastor's son and his mother and father had Um, met at a pretty early age and they end up marrying each other. So I kind of had it in my head that, 
well, this is the guy I'm going to marry one day. And he's already pressuring me into having sex and doing like those types of things. And eventually I gave in and because I was just tired of being asked so often. And, you know, I didn't like know how to stand up for myself as a young teenager. And so I gave into that. Like at 13, I lost my virginity, which is very young. And, um, you know, I you know, I had already lost my virginity by the time these types of things were, you know, going on in the church. So, you know, like, what am I going to do? Become a born and grin virgin? <laughs> like, I didn't really believe in that. Um, but I just, you know, had faith that, you know, God is going to keep me and this guy together and we're going to get married. And that's the only way that I can get forgiveness for the sin is if we get married. Because then, well, yes, We weren't married when it happened. At least if we stay together, I won't have had marriage or I won't have had sex outside of the person that I married. So, yeah, that was pretty damaging. (laughs) That's a lot of pressure and a lot of guilt in the sense, too. Like you said, you have to marry this guy now. Like red flags come up. Oh, just ignore him. You know, this is the man I've got to marry. Oh, he's, you know, really, you know, not a nice guy. You got to marry him anyway, because you had sex with him. It's that that pressure is overwhelming. It's, it's so sad. Yeah. Yeah. There was definitely a lot of that. And I overlooked a a lot of red flags for years. I mean, that relationship was on and off, like pretty much until the time I was 17. So that's a pretty long time (laughs) for teenagers. Um, and yeah, I mean, he was not a very good person, definitely cheated on me and, you know, did other things. And I just felt like I have to forgive him because this is the only way that I'm going to be able to like, you know, not be judged for having sex outside of marriage, which at the time I didn't even want to do because I, I was definitely kind of coerced into doing it. You know, like I, it wasn't even something on my mind. Um, you know, um, I was definitely more into the romantic side of things, holding hands, those type of things. I, you know, I had never, I had never masturbated at that point. And I, I like had sex before any of that had ever happened. Mm. So things definitely happened out of order for me. Um, and I think if there had maybe been like, a little bit more education about uh like sex ed and like maybe other better reasons not to sleep with people <laughs> you know that cop probably could have prevented me from you know experiencing some of those things as early as i did hmm. did you feel like you were as they often portray like you used goods you chewed up bubble gum now and you're when you finally do find a husband you're not giving him as, as good of a prize. Yeah, definitely. I mean, I definitely got into the, you know, trap of like, I know a lot of people talk about how like they will keep track of like what they do with like what people like, what's, you know, what have I done with this person? How many times have I done this? Like keeping a tally of like stuff like that because of feeling like, oh, this is all like going against me and, and my worth, you know, as a wife and what I'm able to bring to a relationship. Nobody wants those types of things. Um, you know, like ideally, like a guy wants a virgin, um, you know, as you know, like what we were told anyways. Um, <laughs> so, yeah, I definitely felt that, but it really wasn't until I was 16 that I started to feel that way because I had been able to hide that for like three years. You know, my parents never found out about it. But, you know, I told you about those tallies. Well, I had made physical tallies and my parents were not beyond going through my room and they found, um, you know, those letters Um, in between the time that we had first started dating, dating and we started seeing other people and we were no longer dating. I had been with other people and I had wrote that and he, um, you know, we had letters to each other talking about like, you know, you know, I've been with this person, I'm sorry, you know, and telling them. And so my mother saw all of that. So at 16, you know, 
she finds out about the things that I had done three years prior. So it's like, yeah, it's a little late, <laughs> you know, for the purity ring and all of these types of things. Um, that was a really big blow up in my house. Um, that was that was pretty traumatic, <laughs> I'll say. Um, mm. Yeah. One of the corollaries to purity culture slash virginity culture is, is modesty culture. Mm -hmm. Did you feel like there was a strong sense of like, keep yourself covered up or, you know, I mean, I, I know that you're saying you're sexually active, but for all mm -hmm. the other men, you know, that weren't, um, that wasn't applicable. Was it like, you need to cover up all the time or you're going to make them stumble? Did you get that messaging? Yeah, definitely got that messaging. Um, like I said, we went to the Pentecostal churches too. So because of that, I mean, I was never going to be wearing a tank top, you know, like that was too much. Like you're going to be wearing a t-shirt under that tank top, <laughs> you know? Um, so there was definitely that. I'm also pretty tall. I'm five, nine. And so, uh, you know, girls who would wear skirts and dresses to school, I was not usually able to get away with that. Um, you know, the midi skirts were not in back then. It was the mini skirts that were in or, you know, so, yeah, I mean, our schools or the schools that I went to had um, dress codes and things like that. But it kind of got to a point where, like, you know, I was like, well, if you're going to wear sh shorts, you need to be Bermuda, Bermuda shorts. You're not going to wear tank tops. Um, you know, like even before I developed, you know, it was like, you know, you're not allowed to wear this stuff. You don't want to cause, you know, your brothers in Christ to stumble or even around like family members. And it's like, whoa, whoa, whoa why do I need to be oh, like worried about family members? <laughs> like if we're worried about family members, I think we have another problem here. You know? Yeah. Um, so yeah, I definitely went through that and it kind of just got to the point where like, I, like I said, we went to the, um, the country churches. And so you, a lot of people wore jeans and I hated that. I loved more of the high church stuff. I loved being able to dress up and wear your Sunday best, but it was just a struggle every Sunday morning to like go back upstairs, change, you know, like you're not going to wear that. <laughs> like, and it was like, okay, well, you know, no show, you can't show bra straps, can't do this, can't do that. I'm like, okay. So it kind of just got to a point where I'm like, all right, well, I guess I'm wearing a baggy t-shirt and jeans. You know, I'm going to wear a button down and jeans. Um, and cause I was just tired of like dealing with like, like wanting to be into fashion, but not really being able to wear anything outside of jeans and a t-shirt. Mm. You know, it's, it's been interesting to me to think through these issues because you know, there's so many aspects of it that you have to think through as you deconstruct and deconvert. But it's been interesting to me how so many Christians are so strongly against homosexuality. And so in effect, you know, they're, they're, this isn't part of their messaging on this, but they would effectively be saying, we want the women to be women. We want the men to be men. We want the women to want the men. We want the men to want the women. We want, you know, women to be feminine. We want the men to be masculine. We don't want any confusion of this. And, and in the midst of that messaging, they're kind of making the women in their churches dress in a very masculine way, like, like downplay yeah. your curves and your beauty. Mm -hmm. And it's such a weird dynamic to me, but in addition to that, and, and, and that's bad enough because you end up basically feeling like you're not comfortable in your own skin. Like who's, you know, who's looking at me, yeah. who's, you know, who am I tempting, who am I causing to stumble? But also I think it causes a lot of people to sexualize especially girls very early and i'm dealing with it in my own family where you know my uh, uh i've got four kids but my we've got boy girl boy girl but our second um she's only six years old and mm -hmm. my wife is insisting that she's wearing a bra and she's you know mm -hmm. she she's not even close to developing yet she's just yeah. a little girl but she needs to wear a bra to you know because you don't want anything to whatever uh, poke through so to speak it's like she's six years old she shouldn't have to worry or think remotely about that kind of stuff yeah and i think it it sexualizes people very early which is weird because they, they would probably say oh the world's sexualizing people so much it's like you're sexualizing little girls like just let them be little girls and yeah. it's it's crazy the way it works and i know there's these recent um documentaries that have come out like about the uh the, the shiny happy people or whatever with the duggars you know, that reflects on how, how this bad stuff ends up hurting people. But mm -hmm. you just, you end up realizing that 
the victims of so many of these things are just innocent kids. They're truly taking away your, and they, they, they say, we want to preserve your innocence, but in saying it, we want to preserve your innocence, they actually take it away. It's yeah. a weird paradox. Yeah, no, I mean, I definitely agree with that. And it, it just seems so weird that at such a young age, I was having to worry about like, are these shorts too short to go outside and play? You know, is some like random man going to see me on the street and sexualize me? And am I going to be the reason for that? Um, that's, yeah, I mean, even even to this day, like I think about stuff like that. Um, you know, I didn't like own a pair of shorts until I like a sh pair of shorts that I would go outside in the house and until I was in college <laughs> because I was just like, eh, you know, and hopefully, you know, if I'm somewhere and someone takes a picture, hopefully my parents don't see it because <laughs> they'll be like, those shorts are a little too short, you know, so. Mm -hmm. yeah. How did you, I know we might be jumping ahead a little bit in this question, but how did you heal from some of that over time to just get comfortable in your own skin and stop worrying about everybody else's thoughts about you and just giving yourself the freedom to be a woman and and delight in whatever part of that, you know, feels great to you? I don't know. I don't know. I think that's still a struggle. Like, honestly, um, yeah, I think that's still a struggle because even like when it comes to um, sexuality and just acknowledging that like, oh, men and women will have sex or people will have sex with each other. That's the thing. Um, I remember when we were traveling for my wedding. I went up, I was driving up with my parents and uh, I had left my birth control at the house. <laughs> and at this time I was, I was living with my husband. We were living together and I had left my birth control and I, we were leaving. And luckily my husband had stayed behind. He had work. And so I was like, okay, I need to call him. I need to let him like, Hey, can you pack this <laughs> when you come up? But I remember being in the back of the truck and saying like, Oh shit. And my dad was like, what did you forget? And I was like, that doesn't matter. Like, don't worry about it. Like I, I'll take care of it. Like, no, what did you forget? And so I was like, I forgot my birth control. It's like, I didn't need to hear that. And I'm just like, I, what do you, I'm going to be married in like <laughs> two days. What do you think's going to happen? You know? So I'm not sure if it was just this idea of like, Oh, you're my daughter. I can't, you know, like, I don't want to even think about that. Or if it was literal, or if it's, I don't know, to me, when I see stuff like that, I just think it's like, it, that's natural. Like, what do you expect is going to be happening? Like once I'm married, you know, whether, you know, if I'm doing those types of things now, like that's like too much for someone to handle. Um, so yeah, it's, I've always kind of had that relationship with my family where like, you can't talk about that stuff. Like we don't need to hear that. That's too much. Um, and covering up and not wearing too much makeup. Like my mom was always like, Oh, you know, I just prefer natural beauty so much. And of course me, like I was into the fashion industry. I had done modeling. I had, you know, I have an aesthetics license. I was doing makeup. Like I was, I was into all of that kind of stuff. So for me, I was like, well, that's like creative expression. Like, you know, I enjoyed doing all that. So I definitely felt shamed for like, uh, like I'm interested in worldly things and I shouldn't be so, um, worldly or petty or like, I need to be like, my mind needs to be focused on higher things. And these are things of the world. So, I mean, I think I still struggle with, you know, like, mm, am I wearing a little too much makeup or like, am I trying to draw attention to myself? Um, but I think it helps because now I, well, I don't know if it helps, but I, you know, I work from home now, so I'm not <laughs> out in the public all the time. So I can kind of like lounge around the house in pajamas now. <laughs> so. I think it's so great too, how so many people are talking about this topic in, in general, more and more, both in the Christian mm -hmm. community and outside, but just getting people to to understand the freedom to say like you've there's a whole part of your personality and your psyche in your worldview that you could be just celebrating without thinking about you know who's who's judging me or am i making someone a stumbling block just just live your life and enjoy your body and i i remember i've told this story before but i remember at bible college that the dean of men got us all together once and it was like it was like he had one shot the whole year. He didn't get us together much. It was like one time. And the message was just stop masturbating. Mm -hmm. And 
as I, at the time, of course, I thought, well, it's, he probably has some kind of inside track that guys are doing it. And so he wants to mitigate that because he thinks it's sinful. So at the time, it didn't really hit me as like a horrible message. But as I reflected on it later, I was thinking, where is like the message first that says, your body is awesome. You know, your body mm-hmm. is a male. You're making 50,000 sperm an hour. Right. Celebrate that. Celebrate the urges to have sex and have sex often and and the, the drive for eroticism. Like, that's a good mm-hmm. thing. But it was always yeah. the, the, the good message never came. It was, you know, kind yeah. of couched and well, I celebrated in marriage, but it was never like, but just even apart from marriage, like your mm-hmm. body sexually is amazing. Yeah. And and just delight in how you how you are. And and certainly the, you mentioned, you know, masturbation, being able to to enjoy pleasure. But so much of that I think is is so when you get into the Bible's theology and it talks about your your the the contrast between your spirit and your flesh, and the flesh wars against the spirit. And you're supposed to put to death the bodily desires that you have, you end up very much with this mixed message where you're supposed to love sex in one sense when you're married because it glorifies God and it exemplifies the relationship of Christ to the church, which is really bizarre. You know, is this mm-hmm. Christ having sex with the church? I don't know. But yeah. it's like you're supposed to delight in it in some ways because God made it, but in other ways, you're supposed to really think of, of it as like a lesser issue. It's very Gnostic, you know, you know, the spirit's mm-hmm. good, this the, the body's bad. Yeah. But on top of that, one of the things that I, I love sharing when I when it comes up is it's really weird to thinking about just nudity, like the mm-hmm. topic of nudity in general. And I was always very much, you know, traditionally, you know, I didn't think it was a good idea for, for nudity to happen, especially like in, in photography or artwork. Mm-hmm. And I was at Bob Jones and I was working in the art gallery there. They're a very ultra conservative school. Mm-hmm. And I'm I'm guarding, you know, Rembrandt's, I'm guarding these great Baroque paintings and just loving it, eating it up hours yeah. and hours where nobody comes to. And I can just literally stand there and just stare at paintings. Just I could eat that up for years. Mm-hmm. But it, at one point I got assigned to a gallery where there was a lot of Baroque art that had topless women in it. Mm-hmm. And it really kind of sh- surprised me. I was like, what is what is all this topless art doing at Bob Jones University? Mm-hmm. And I talked to the curator, whoever the person in charge, and there was basically strongly defending it saying, no, this is, you know, the body's beautiful. This is artwork. This is not pornography. Mm -hmm. And it was one of the first kind of wheels that got my mind turning to say, Mm -hmm. is there a time to rethink how we've been seeing the body? Because if if, if Bob Jones can accept topless women and artwork in their gallery, even though it's Baroque era, it's still topless women. Like maybe I need to rethink this because I was at the time very prudish, I'm sure. Mm-hmm. And it's interesting thinking through it. Do you did you ever think through the idea idea of nude art and how you responded to it before versus how you do now? I don't. I I mean, I grew up. My mom was pretty good about taking me to museums. Um, okay. Like San Antonio has a lot of great museums, art museums, and um, anytime we travel, we go to museums. So I was never really put off by any of that. But I certainly never got any sense of you know we're supposed to be amazed that god created these bodies but we're not allowed to be amazed at the bodies themselves <laughs> you know and so i definitely it wasn't until much later on that um you know as i, I wouldn't call it so much body positivity but more of body neutral neutrality i'm sh- maybe they've heard that term before um, yeah. I kind of got to a point of that and also just being amazed at what the human body can do. Um, and instead of sexualizing it or, you know, not look liking certain features of yourself, just, um, you know, just acknowledging that the processes of life and aging are beautiful and we can acknowledge that. Um, um, and, and as far as art goes, I really like Gustav Klimt. And he has a lot of um, images uh, with like kind of older women and like, you know, sagging and, you know, kind of the processes of life. And he has beautiful women who are plump and uh, have plump breasts and the very opposite. And so I really like seeing, you know, the spectrum of, um, you know, those types of things. So, yeah, that never bothered me. But as, you know, definitely as I've got older and I've kind of come out of all of those things, I've definitely grown to appreciate the body much more than I did before where before I just believed you need to cover it up it's sin you know um you know yeah just you should the body is shameful I definitely felt that way Hmm. and I want to get onto another topic in a minute but just to add maybe one more thought about it it's really interesting to me how Christians fight so much against pornography and yet they actually create a dynamic where you're driven into a secret world where 
men are going to want to look at a woman's bra straps and her bare breasts. And they know mentally they're not supposed to. So they try to, you know, not go there in their minds, but they want to. And mm -hmm. it's perfectly normal. It's perfectly normal for want for men to want to stare at women's breasts. Mm -hmm. And purity culture, of course, says, no, it's not until you're married, of course, with your wife. And yet what ends up happening is, of course, you get the very good facade of like, okay, I am going to do the party line. I'm going to, you know, be, be pure. I'm going to be, you know, pursue modesty and so forth. I'm going to protect my eyes. If I accidentally look at something, I won't look twice for sure. And guys, especially, I mean, I can't speak for girls, but you know, guys heavily, what ends up happening, happening is they create two different worlds. Mm -hmm. There's a world where everyone sees them as a good upstanding person. Then there's a, their real world. And of course, that's why we hear all these stories and, and um, uh, numbers about, you know, all whatever, 25% of pastors, whatever it is, are, are secretly doing porn. And it's because there is, there are two different worlds and they end up creating this secret, this secret life. But it's fascinating to me, this concept that's been, I've heard many times over the years, that if you bring things into the light, they lose their power. Mm -hmm. And so if you bring, you know, uh, if you, if you're thinking, oh, I want to have a pornographic mindset, I want to look at all this stuff. Well, if you just from the beginning, were used to seeing bare bodies it wouldn't have this power over you. You'd think, oh mm -hmm. yeah, it's it's a body. It's beautiful. Right. Um, but what I, and I remember going on a missions trip to New Guinea and we were driving on this truck to the to the place where we we're going to be. And there's topless women, tribe, tribal women mm -hmm. in the fields. And the American girls were like staring at all of us American guys. We had all just met. So they didn't know us, but you know, it's, the, the culture just picks right up even with strangers, you know, mm -hmm. all these, these white Americans doing missions. So all the, the the girls in the missions trip were looking, staring, not at the trial, but at us to see which ones of you are looking because we we're watching you. Right. You better not be staring. <laughs> and, but it's like when you bring things into the light, they do lose their power. And mm -hmm. when you tell people it's okay to look, it's okay to think it's beautiful. It's okay to look twice, three times, four times. You get people weaned from this secrecy and they start being free to just live their lives, especially like you mentioned with the whole you know, being able to see the different stages of life and think I'm not addicted to some, you know, 18 year old, you know, girl or 21 year old girl with a perfect body. I can see the different stages and they're beautiful. They're all lovely. And you begin to free yourself to celebrate all the seasons. And you just, the Christian perspective ag against that is just, it's so destructive in my opinion. It really, it yeah. creates two different worlds. And a lot of people, honestly, they never escape. Even when they leave Christianity, they still feel they'll, they'll look at look at something or think of something and you know it's pornographic and they'll mm -hmm. still feel guilty even after they think there's no god they're still feel bad about it it's very bizarre yeah um with you mentioned your husband is mm -hmm. just curious how did you all meet and was your goal at that point to love the lord to serve the lord and have a christian home or how, how did that all play out no <laughs> that was not my goal um at probably Probably around 18, I, my senior year of high school, I kind of made it known to my parents that I really don't want to go to this church anymore, the the the, the country church. Um, and I think they're disappointed. So basically what I, they're, what they let me do is instead of going to church on Sundays, um, mainly it was like, I was just like, I don't want to go to Sunday school. Like, I don't want to be in the youth program. And it mainly was, I don't want to be a part of the youth program because I don't want to be around, um, you know, my ex and his youth pastor father that was involved in things. And it was very hard for me to be around them. And, and I I just didn't want to be around anymore. So I said, you know, I'll go to regular church with you guys. I'll go to like the women's group studies with you. I just don't want to go to youth group. So, you know, my dad and I would stay home and we would, you know, read the Bible, you know, go through the Old Testament and stuff like that together. But my first year of college, um, I started kind of getting into like meditation stuff and more new age stuff. I had a tarot reading <laughs> And, um, I, that kind of started me on a path of like learning about crystals and all of that stuff. And so my first year of college, I went to community college that was close by. I was a pretty good student, but I also did not study. 
and um, pass things very easily. And so my parents were like, we're not going to send you to college if we don't know that you're going to, you know, not be wasting money (laughs) and time. So you're going to go to a local community college. We'll see how you do. You know, if you get all A's and B's, you can go to university after this. So for that first year, I spent a lot of time getting into the new age stuff. Um, and Can I ask when what, I, why did yeah. you like, what was the attraction? Uh, well, because of the, like right before, basically I had a, a terror reading and it was just really spot on, um, with some of the stuff that she had got some of the information that she was able to do. I mean, and of course I've learned a lot of the techniques since then, as far as cold reading and stuff like that, there are some things I can't explain. I have no idea how she knew those things, but regardless, whatever it was, she was trying to offer me a six telling me that I had a curse on me. And also mind you, we're in San Antonio. So a lot of people are into like the Bruja stuff, Um, and so it's kind of like Catholicism entwined with like witchcraft. Um, so she was kind of up, up that alley. And so, you know, I, a friend and I went and did this and afterwards we started, just started kind of like on this path to learning about all this stuff. And this lady told me like, oh, you need this like $600 crystal cleansing. And I'm like, I am a broke college student lady there. I don't have $600 to give you, even if I wanted to. And so that pretty much led me on the path of like, I'm going to learn how to do my own crystal cleansing and I'm going to remove this curse myself. So I remember going, um, I, I worked at a place with, um, uh, I had a Hispanic gay friend that, um, I'd hang out with and he, his, his grandmother was like really into Santeria and stuff like that. And so I remember going with him down to San Antonio and like picking up all this stuff, like sage and all this stuff. And like, I'm going to like, I'm going to learn about all this stuff myself. So and there's a really funny story of like, right before I first left for college, I was cleansing the crystals. And to do that, you like leave them out overnight and um, you can put them in water and stuff like that. And the moon water is supposed to like recharge the crystals or whatever. So I remember I left this out and my mom went out that morning to like drink tea or whatever and have her mor- morning devotional. And she saw all these crystals laid out on the table in the backyard. And she came in like, what are all these? I'm like, oh, sorry, I must have left those out. I forgot about them last night. So I hid, I hid that stuff for like, I don't know, pro- probably a good year or so. But I got really into all that. <laughs> Can I ask that that's fascinating because it it seems like from the theological perspective you were coming from mm-hmm. that that would have been seen as garbage um just yeah you know obviously from our perspective now christianity as a whole is mythology but mm-hmm. to say that's definitely mythology or you know some version of whatever better word we'd put there but this is not it's easy it's, it's, at worst it's of the mm-hmm. devil but mm-hmm. at, the, at the least this is silly this like this was really stupid Right. Um, this has no power over my life. Just like astrology, just the fact that you're born in September doesn't make right. you this or that. Um, how does that, how did you get over that and not just say either number one, this is silly, mm-hmm. but number two, if, if this lady has any mm-hmm. sense of accuracy to this, that there is mm-hmm. some kind of spiritual power that's happening, mm-hmm. the answer is of course, Jesus. The answer is the power mm-hmm. of the gospel. The answer is prayer, right. fasting, um, all that kind of stuff. How did you like, were you at that point? It sounds like I just, I guess what I'm asking is mm-hmm. I think I must have missed a step. Was there a spot at which you began to kind of drift, uh, you know, the, the slippery slope, as they used to say, drift a little bit away from it where the theology mm-hmm. wasn't front and center? Um, No, not really. <laughs> you, you really didn't miss anything. But I think once again, because I had been open to going to other churches and seeing other stuff and that lady was into the Santeria. So there was Christianity mixed in with it, you know, uh, because of that, I was thinking, well, maybe there's some truth to this. And how would she know something like this? If she didn't have access to some knowledge, some like divine thing that she was able to tap into, maybe she's picking, you know, maybe she's getting messages from angels, like, cause that's, Mm. you know, tarot people believe in all that stuff. And I think also, if I had grown up, grew up in a branch of Christianity that didn't believe in like angels and demons and interacting down here, because I already believed in curses. I believed in that kind of stuff. 
uh, because there's curses in the Bible, you know, there's demons in the Bible, there's prophesies, prophesying in the Bible. My mom believed that like witches were real, like that type of stuff is real. And yeah, while it's bad and of oh, Satan, like even in the Bible, um, you know, God acknowledges that there are other gods, <laughs> you know, that exist. So I I kind of just felt like, well, you know, at that time, of course, that's like a transitional phase in life where I was like leaving my parents' house and I was actually going to be going away. And I was, you know, I'm about five hours away from my parents. So that's a pretty significant amount of, you know, hours to be away, away from your parents and which my parents were helicopter parents and very like on top of everything. I'm an only child. So they didn't have any other kids to look around and worry about. I was the only one who had who I had attention on me all the time. Um, and so because of that, um, I kind of looked at my opportunity to be able to go to university. I passed that um, school year, you know, flying colors. My so parents were like, okay, you can go. Are you sure you don't want us to come to the, you know, uh, college that's closer? That's only an hour away. Like, no, I'm sure. <laughs> I love you, but, you know, like I need to go. Um, and so I ended up going. And while I was away, for that first year, like I met my husband the first day of college. So we met pretty early on. I was not planning on getting involved in a relationship at all. Um, I had downloaded um, Tinder. And the reason I had downloaded it was because I wasn't familiar with the area. Um, I specifically came to North Texas because it was more of like a hippie community um it was you know very like um into the arts and music and i just wanted to be around that more because where i was at in san antonio it was you know shooting guns you know riding horses <laughs> you know it was like the antithesis of all that <laughs> and so i just wanted to get away from that and kind of have like enjoy my own world and the things that I was actually interested in that because I didn't really feel like I ever got the chance to explore things that I cared about. Um, so yeah, when I came up here, I, I kept reading stuff. I remember like one of the first like woo books um, was like Miguel Ruiz, The Four Agreements. I don't know if you've ever read that book. Uh, it rings a bell, but I, I, I've gotten more familiar over the years with the cult, especially like Enochian yeah. magic spells and Mm -hmm. all that stuff it's 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 a whole new world once you open the that can yeah. of worms <laughs> yeah so Miguel Ruiz I would I mean I haven't read the book in a while but I remember it being a very good book but just being able to deal with like kind of setting up a like a morality framework of like how to conduct yourself in the world in the world um and I really I just resonated with it and when I met my husband um, he was into that stuff too. He was into the crystals. He was into astrology, like very deep into astrology. Um, you know, we're not talking the back of Cosmo magazine type of astrology. He could do the math to figure out your ascendant and this and Chiron, like aspects of Chiron and like all of that stuff. So it was very in depth. Um, and so for the first years like of our marriage um and like first five probably i guess we were into all of that stuff and you know i took comparative um comparative uh religion classes or comparative mythology and religion classes and i i got into that so i was um exposed to those types of things i was we had friends who did reiki and kundalini like um you know kundalini magic and kundalini like breathing sessions like you know we were like very into all that stuff and at the time i didn't i didn't quite know what i believed um i hadn't i wouldn't have ever i wouldn't have called myself a christian at that point but I would have said, I believe in a higher power. I don't know what that is or if it's, you know, if we're all kind of, I kind of, once again, I was kind of believing along the path of maybe like the universalism, like one of the last churches I ever went to was a Unitarian Universalist church. And, and really mm -hmm. those churches aren't very church-like. You really go and they, um, 
you know, I remember like the last, like one of the last ones we went to kind of talked about like the water systems and the public water systems and how to conserve water and stuff like that. It's very different <laughs> from like any church, but it's very human humanitarian. And I like that they weren't condemning anyone to hell and they were accepting of the, um, of like, you know, gay, you know, like all of that kind of stuff. I was, I, I like that they were more open because I had gay friends growing up and I really hated that yeah, the religions I came from really shunned those people. And I just felt like that's not our place. Like it's God's place to judge. It's not ours. We need to love them whether we believe what they're doing is right or not. You know, that was always kind of where I was coming from. Hmm. I have to just say it. It's a weird that's a weird story to me in a sense. And I, I don't mean that in any way, I hope um, disrespectfully, but mm -hmm. it, the Bible is, is so it's our way or the highway kind of mm -hmm. thing. Like Jesus is the only way to mm -hmm. the father. The, um, you know, there's only one way and it's Jesus. There's only one way it's the cross. Mm -hmm. And, you know, very wide is the path to destruction. Narrow is the way to life. Mm -hmm. It sounds like you were definitely doing what I would have, labeled at the time like mm -hmm. a, a drift like you were slowly mm -hmm. drifting away um at, at in that mix though one of the questions that would come to my mind is where did you stand with the whole idea of like you mentioned universalism but that's mm -hmm. you know bring up the, the idea of the afterlife mm -hmm. where did you stand with the idea of of where you would go when you died and did you fear yeah. that like was there any fear that if you were drifting from the truth potentially mm -hmm. that you yeah. were putting yourself in danger of of hellfire mm -hmm. or or whatever you know version of hell you believe in at that time just just the sense of like okay mm -hmm. there might be more truth to the crystals and the mm -hmm. tarot cards there might be more truth to the universalist perspective mm -hmm. but at the same time you knew where you came from your mm -hmm. roots were jesus is lord and no one else there's no other way to the father except through him how did you like process just the emotions of of and the, the theology mm -hmm. of, of and the worldview of wondering mm -hmm. what happens when you die because if i mean if there's no hell mm -hmm. and you know it sounds like you're you're drifting in my mm -hmm. uh, from what i understand yeah. further and further away from a condemnation mode where it's like you know sin is sin if you know you know mm -hmm. obey god or you're sinful if mm -hmm. you're drifting away from a condemnation mentality you're drifting away from jesus is the only way mm -hmm. then that does bring up you know, the afterlife and where, where you, is there really one there? And did you fear that you might be literally walking away from the Lord and that this whole mm -hmm. thing might be a deception, a self-deception, and that you might truly be damning yourself in that process, even though you're receiving the benefits mm -hmm. of being more open-minded and probably making more friends with people you wouldn't have before, right. but the benefits would be outweighed by the, the, the cost that would have ultimately be involved. Just, you know, you probably won't be surprised, but as a Christian, I was not in the Bible as much. Uh, I haven't spent as much time in the Bible as when I was a Christian <laughs> since after I got out of it. So I think because of the denominations that I came from, it was much more about being spirit led. So, um, you know, if you come across, you know, Christians like, I don't know if you ever heard Jesse Lee Peterson, if you know who that is. No. Um, yeah, he's an interesting um, individual. Um, he, he interviews people that he believes in God, but, you know, people will talk to him and ask him about questions about the Bible. And he's like, ah, oh, it doesn't matter. I'm Christ. You know, I have the spirit. I know it's written in my heart. I don't need that. You know, if there's inconsistency in the Bible, it doesn't matter. So, um, you know, the, you know, God puts that spirit of truth, you know, in our hearts or whatever. Um, so I, I lived my life more like that, thinking that there you know, there might be something to it. And because I believed in, once again, I believed in spirits um, and I believed in the Holy Spirit, it got me asking questions like, well, how do you know when you're invoking the Holy Spirit that you're not invoking another spirit? How do you know? Because, you know, if you are get into any of the woo stuff, you know, there are people who will like open themselves and let entities speak through them you know like if you're like do the ouija stuff or call, calling in spirits and there are plenty of other religions that did these things and so i started asking questions to my mom like well how do you know when somebody's speaking in tongues that they're like that they've they've opened themselves 
to the Holy Spirit. How do you know it's not like they're not being taken over by some other spirit? Um, you know, I had a lot of questions like that. And I, I just wasn't in the Bible. I wasn't in the Bible as much as I felt like, well, if there's truth to this, if, you know, my life starts to feel easy or if I'm not depressed, then I'm probably right. I'm on track because it talks about, you know, it does talk about like with all, with Christ, all things are possible. And, you know, I grew up in a home believing that like, you know, um, you know, if you don't have the spirit, your life will fall into shambles, <laughs> essentially. And so I thought, well, if I no longer have depression, or if I'm able to get the job I want, or if things are going right for me, it's because whatever spiritual path I'm on, it's it's right, you know. So hmm. that's how I looked at a lot of it. Yeah, it's very it's very different path in some ways from what I'm used to, but it's I can see how how it could evolve that way. It's interesting. So you, it sounds like in some ways you weren't as threatened by your worldview evolving. Like there was, it wasn't like most of it's, it's mm-hmm. you're familiar with, um, what's that? Is it Qbert or there's some, some game I'm thinking of where like the, 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 the arcade character has to stand on like this one little square and it like moves them. And it's this mm-hmm. sense of like, if you, if you step on that, if you stay on that, you're fine. But if you move off mm-hmm. of it, you're in big, big danger. It sounds like you were open to some gray area to a lot of these topics and you were okay with it evolving. Is that fair to say? Yeah, I think I had a level of epistemic humility, but I also, I had not really um, like logical thinking. I had not cultivated that though. (laughs) So, and that's really the problem is where I got into the trap of all the woo stuff. Um. But yeah, I was open to it changing and evolving. And I think maybe once again, just because I had seen my mom herself do that and, you know, she, her being raised in that and coming into something else. Um, so, yeah, but I definitely know I, I will say like at this time, I was still praying to God. Like I just was not I wasn't sure it was Yahweh. I wasn't sure that it was Jesus. I was just a general God. If anybody's out there, <laughs> listen to me, <laughs> you know, hear my prayers. You know, that's pretty much like I, you know, I, even when I was practicing all the woo stuff, you know, got into the witchcraft stuff, everything from like <laughs> green witch kitchen stuff to Crowley, like, you know, darker stuff. And even through all of that, I was never able to like, I don't really resonate with any of this stuff. But when I talk about like not really developing like logic and critical thinking skills, I remember like my senior year um, sitting in a business class and taking a senior class, senior year of high school, um, remember taking this test about what religion am I? And it was basically just this really, really long test. And it was like asking, like, what do you believe in? You know, do you believe this? Or, you know, what's your opinion of, um, you know, LGBTQ, you know, do you believe in this? Do you believe in this? And so I was coming out of a framework from like, well, what do I resonate? Like what feels right to me? So I definitely was coming at it from like, what's my truth? And now I'm definitely not like, I've gotten far away from that. And I'm like, yeah, I don't believe we all have truths. We might all have different experiences, but that's very different from what's true and what's false. So as you're going through this, you mentioned before your husband was kind of already in some of these things as well with crystals. Mm-hmm. So he he was not pulling you back to fundamentalist Christianity at all. It's, it sounds like we're with you starting to develop the cognitive or, or being more aware of the cognitive dissonance, mm-hmm. thinking through how to be more more reasonable in your faith and and in your worldview. Mm-hmm was as you began to ask harder and harder questions was he Mm -hmm. following along with that as well at that point or or were you all able to kind of pair up on this journey or did you all take divergent paths at all um you know he was interested in some things that i wasn't really interested in so much like um as far as i thought the astrology was interesting but i'm not gonna i wasn't gonna sit around and read a whole bunch of books about it i wasn't gonna learn how to calculate (laughs) different things like he was really into that you know he got into a point where he was like giving professional readings 
you know, he was going to get like employed by one of the companies around, you know, one of the businesses around here and come in during whenever they had like events and stuff like that. So he but it got was safe it. for y'all to talk about it. Like you, you felt yes. safe. Okay. That's good. Yeah. Yeah. It was safe for us to talk about things. Now I will say the logic didn't come to much later. Okay. Um, so, but really that, that whole path of the woo stuff, I, we both still had a fear of hell. So that was like hardwired. <laughs> we mm. really still had that. So it was almost like I need to find the truth because if I die, it was like, what if I don't die the right way? Or like, what if I'm not in the right religion when I die? Um, you know, just like if you look at other religions or look at um, like the um, like, uh, if you look at like Egyptian magic and stuff like that, they believe that you have to be like buried in certain ways. Even like there are Christian religions that you cannot be, you know, you can't, um, you can't be burned. You have to be buried and, yeah. you know, in order for you to go to heaven and, you know, Hindus have a whole nother belief. And so it kind of just got me on this path to like learning about all the different religions and like learning about what they believed. And I was still operating under like, well, what do I resonate with, you know, and working when it comes to like some of like the, the meditation or the different things like, well, what works? Like, what can I have an experience with? And because I never had an experience with Christianity I, you know, like, yes, I was saved. I was baptized. I had emotions and feelings, but when, at the end of the day, when the pastor says, do you know that, you know, that, you know, that you're going to heaven? I'm like, no, <laughs> like, how do, how am I supposed to know? Only God knows, right? Like only God knows your heart and God knows my heart probably better than I do. So I don't know. I don't know how anybody could know that. Um, so can I ask real quick about that for a second? Because mm -hmm there i i get what you're saying but mm -hmm. there is from a christian perspective that simple gospel mm -hmm. um and you, you mentioned earlier at the, at the beginning the sinner's prayer mm -hmm. um you know to put it in a sentence mm -hmm. we're, we're horrible sinners deserving mm -hmm. punishment and god is a wonderful savior provided through jesus mm -hmm. um you know longer than that jesus came lived a sinless life then died on our behalf mm -hmm. took our punishment he rose again proving mm -hmm. his power over death and the simple gospel is if you simply accept his um his provision his death mm -hmm. as as your covering that his his death takes the punishment that you and I deserve mm -hmm. and that therefore we're saying god i accept christ as my substitute he is my spotless lamb that mm -hmm. um that was sacrificed to appease you to appease mm -hmm. your wrath that if you do believe that you you do, you can know that you're saved um mm -hmm. did, it sounds like that that didn't even though that that's very strong mm -hmm. in so many christian yeah. groups it sounds like that didn't really make a lot of sense to you to 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 give you that sense of peace of mind that you were definitely secure no i certainly never had peace in christianity and b believing those things um you know i had a lot of problems when people would say you know like oh god spoke to me i'm like what do you mean god spoke to you like did you heard it like <laughs> you know like oh god god gave me a word to share with you like you know he put it on my heart i'm like what does that mean does that mean you you're thinking about me and you've been thinking these thoughts and you think that god is telling you these things and you want to pray for me like what what does that mean <laughs> um and you know that was definitely something that like i shared with my husband i'm like like when people would say that or like when you were speaking in tongues or when you had these experiences, like, how did you interpret that? Like, did you ever say things like that? Because as a Christian, I never claimed that God was speaking through me, but there were definitely plenty of people in our church who are willing to say like, you know, God is speaking through me to tell you that you need to do this or you need to marry this person or like whatever. And I just always felt like, uh, I feel like that's kind of like blasphemous, honestly, <laughs> you know, like I felt like there's no, I don't think so. Like that's, well, God didn't lay it on my heart, <laughs> you know? So yeah, I always, I always struggled with that hmm. and I don't know, but yeah, I was just more open to things and I just felt like 
well, if I'm finding truth and I'm finding help in other areas, there must be, there must be something to it. And I need to explore this, but I definitely still had a fear of hell. I still had a fear of demons and believed in angels, believed in spirits, believed in like bad juju and karma and like that type of stuff, which while Christianity doesn't use those terms, like there's a lot that, you know, kind of connects same thing with like the prosperity gospel believed in that. And when I got into the, um, the woo woo stuff or the new age stuff, they have the, um, manifestation. Um, and so, um, if, when you believe in that, it's like, well, the things that you think about, you're going to draw those things towards you. So, you know, if you have a mega- negative mind space, you're going to draw negativity in your life. You're not going to get that job. You know, you need to be, um, you know, like a higher being or whatever to attain like this level of wealth or happiness or whatever, which really is very in line with the prosperity gospel. It is the same thing wrapped up and tied with a different colored bow. That is the same thing. (laughs) So there was just a lot that came, you know, that connected for me. But yeah, it, it just, I think just because I wasn't in the word as much and it was more just about like feelings and I don't know, but you know, this is what I believe. <laughs> yeah. And this will be for maybe another time to go into more detail, but it's, if you're familiar with the term animism uh, from mm-hmm. a tribal perspective, it's yeah. Christianity it is such an animistic worldview. It's ridiculous. And it's, it's, it's amazing to me how when mm-hmm. we look at tribal people's worldviews, it seems so primitive to us. And yet all we've mm-hmm. done is basically, you know, kind of paint it over it and, you know, put a veneer mm-hmm. on it. But we very much are into, you know, Christianity is a woo-woo religion. Yeah. We just have certain ways that we kind of mask the bizarreness of it. But, you mm-hmm. know, if, if you, the whole idea of, you know, eating someone's uh, body and drinking their mm-hmm. blood, all that stuff and on and on and on it goes, This, these things are 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 mm-hmm. effectively tribal we're we're, we're yeah. acting out tribalism and just because it's you know accepted by millions of people doesn't make it any different it's just mm-hmm. culturally acceptable tribalism mm-hmm. and animism and it's a lot of that stuff if you put it in pure animistic terms mm-hmm. people would say oh i reject that worldview utterly mm-hmm. but then you you look at it in christianity and it's like they completely accept it and it's it's amazing how it's just i think you're, you you alluded to this a little bit before but when you're used to it and you just grow up in it you just think it's real. You think it's normal. And yeah. so many of us never really ask that question of like, just because this is what my normal is, does that make it any better or more valid than other people's perspectives? And it's, it's such a critical issue. Right. Yeah. So what you, you mentioned all, all this new age stuff mm-hmm. in some ways, I would imagine though, that, that there was some freedom and, and, you know, maybe even beauty of feeling like you're connecting with the universe better than ever. Mm-hmm. How did you get past that? Cause that, I could see people getting there and staying there if it was, if it was Mm -hmm. a really positive experience, how did you move past that? Um, yeah, I mean, I had experiences, good experiences and bad experiences. You know, I like learned about lucid dreaming and astral projection and I had some crazy experiences with that and things that I was, you know, I was never able to speak to God or hear God. And I had some really crazy experiences and I can't, explain those but instead of claiming i know exactly the truth you know i just say i can't explain them and i don't know um and so you know like i said my husband was really into astrology and so i started learning about there's a book called like the book of like the law of one or something like that and it is a kooky book it is like in the seventies or eighties, like this, these group of college kids got together and they were like transcribing, um, like transcribing a deity that was speaking through this person. It it was, it was just wild. Um, I was listening to people like Teal Swan and stuff like that. They believe in like star seeds and like that people come down from other uh, planets and stuff like that to teach us lessons and like just absolutely crazy stuff. But, you know, and I kind of always just like kept an open mind about some of these things. I never believed in any particular, like one particular religion. Um, 
you know, I definitely, I was interested in the tarot cards. I, I learned how to give tarot readings. I learned about the cards that like took years to like learn how to do that. Um, I still find all that stuff very interesting, but uh, even from the beginning, I realized like, this is all very like Freudian. This is just psychology. This is just talking about, you know, uh, the fool's journey. And there's a story that goes along with that. And if you resonate with the cards, great, but getting any divine messages from them, you know, and that's kind of how I thought about it. It's like a form of therapy almost, um, and, or like a writing journal prompt almost. Um, but so my husband was into astrology. And at the time I was also reading this book and it was just, it, it had some interesting insights. I didn't really know if I felt like I was resonating with it much, but it kind of like wrapped it all up. And it's just this long, long book. There's like a series of them. And it kind of just said, because, you know, I think we're all searching for this. A lot of re the reason people are drawn to religions is because they want the how-to book for life <laughs> you know like they want the answers where do i go after i die you know they want all of that like what is the purpose for my life um religion so ill-equips people to deal with the realities of life and making decisions for themselves and um you know pretty much the book wrapped up and set wrapped up with saying like what I got from it was like, we're put on earth to experience life. Like, but you know, I was like, somehow that was profound, but it's like, did it really take this long, this many books to get through it? Like how many YouTube videos that I like watch of people interpret interpreting the book? And I'm like, okay, well, I, I guess I can get on board with that. That's not really that crazy. Um, so but with all of these, you know, I was in college, I told you I had like uh, learned about the comparative religions. My husband was in astrology. I started and he's also very into history and I was not into history. I really liked literature. Um, and so I think just over the years of kind of acquiring all the, this information about other religions, learning about um, I started getting into like astro theology through that because those books kind of talked about that stuff. And I was like, oh, wow, the sun rising, you know, the moon god, you know, and night, you know, day conquering night the next day. I'm like, this is all anim animism, like what you were just talking about. Like, this is primordial gods. Like, that's all this is, you know, learning about, um, uh, what is it? Lucifer, the morning star and Venus and where that is in the sky. And once again, like I would not have been able to like figure that out without my husband because he was into that stuff. He's like, oh, well, this is in the sky. This is in the sky. This is opposite. And so it was just lining up with mythology. So I started learning. Oh, OK, so these are star stories. <laughs> like most of this is just star stories. Um, at that time, I had already written comparative papers on Gilgamesh and Noah and Iliad and the Odyssey or sorry yeah the yeah the Iliad um, Homer and Virgil's epics so I had already been writing about those things and I knew that Gilgamesh predated the Bible and so I was like well that's a little bit more than ironic um <laughs> perhaps so um it was really just more about being able to contextualize history uh, realizing things are not adding up. Um, but it was because I wasn't as well read. I wasn't reading the Bible for all the specific things that was saying, and I wasn't able to point out inconsistencies. I wasn't able to um, realize that, yeah, these people weren't alive at the time, but they're saying that they're alive and that these books were based off of these other books. They still, you know, everything's based off of Mark, and then there's stuff added into Mark. Um, you know, it doesn't make sense that, um, Noah's talking about, um, having animals on that are, um, kosher. They didn't have kosher laws at that time. Why would that have even been significant? You know, it's not because somebody added it in afterwards. <laughs> so, and that kind of broke apart the infallibility of the Bible for me. Um, so yeah, the star stories that started being interesting. But then I think for me, what kept me in it as long as, as long as I did was hell, hell and Satan. And so, but through all those other things, like the star stories, I was able to deconstruct 
like Satan figure realize uh, Satan is the adversary. It means the adversary, Satan, Lucifer, the devil, all completely different things. <laughs> you know, they are not the same. We conflate them. Um, like learning that kind of stuff. And then I started learning about other religions like Judaism. I was like, well, maybe, you know, maybe I need to start going back to like the original, original, like what's the original religion? What's the first religion? Um, when I started to learn that like Jews don't really believe in a hell and, you know, like, okay, there's like separation from God. You can say that that's a type of hell, but at the end, everyone goes to heaven unless you've committed some like atrocious act so if there's no hell you know there's no or there's no hell then like what's the point in believing because jews believe that like even non-believers can go to heaven so that was kind of what broke apart <laughs> for me it's interesting we mentioned the the devil thing how this, so many things are conflated mm -hmm. i always thought too it's interesting how in the garden of eden we were always told that in that story the the snake was was the devil right. but then when you get into jewish mythology mm -hmm. you realize that that snake most likely originally was adam's first wife lilith right who had taken on that form and and then realizing you know he may have even had another wife before then but mm -hmm. it just it's it's amazing once you really unpack it and i i have to ask as you as you were unpacking all these things was there ever a point though where you just said wow, like none of this is real. Like how, how did your final getting over that hump happen of, of like, mm -hmm. I'm, I'm not like, this has no pull on my heart and my mind at all anymore. Yeah. I, I think the Jewish stuff is kind of what solidified it for me. I think I was like, uh, watching, watching Tobias Singer. Uh, I was watching him and, um, I was like, okay, like I, I don't, think that any of this is real anymore uh, that's that is when it broke apart for me but yeah being able to contextualize history there's a great channel called useful charts and he has some biblical um videos that are great and you know me i was able to realize like um what is it is it not david um but the the king that's supposedly around where um G um where Jesus's parents leave and they're trying to escape this um census and not be counted in it or they had to go to they had to go to this place to get counted in a census but like if we look at like when these were taken the reason the census was taken was because this guy died and they needed to collect that information and so so it's like okay so this king wasn't around he wouldn't have been around to even make these orders to go kill all these children to find this this um this messiah like he wouldn't have been around for that so that's not true <laughs> hmm. it's amazing too when i think one of the things that happens it's really cool is once you start to kind of change your your ability to change your eyes to see these things mm -hmm you begin to realize this is a crafted story, a well-crafted story in some ways. These stories of Jesus, they're multiple different stories by different authors, not just probably one author per gospel, but possibly many authors per gospel, but certainly at least many different people over the span of the at least 60 gospels we know of, and mm -hmm. probably hundreds of gospels in total that ever existed. You realize like once you start to read even just the four canonical ones, that these are stories that are they're crafting it and and once you see mm -hmm. things like i love how being able to see for example that that the story of turning water into wine was a copy of dionysius mm -hmm. or you know G uh, jesus having a purple robe and a crown of thorns was a copy of helios mm -hmm. or crying tears of blood and water was a copy of zeus you add these things in but then you also add in the way that they copied from the old testament like you're mentioning you know the, the the slaughter of the innocents that being a copy of the old testament story as well with um who was it was it um moses but whatever that you know the earlier stories were where they're copying this stuff and mm -hmm. possibly they were copying earlier stories too of course it doesn't just stop in the old testament right but then you add in things like the astro theology where jesus is is telling the disciples look for the water bearer who is going to tell you about how to find the upper room. Mm -hmm. And then you start looking at things like the other, uh, the other uh, philosophers 
that everybody was aware of. So for example, Plato's Timaeus Mm -hmm. was so well known. And then Jesus heals a blind man called the son of Timaeus. And then of course, as a Socrates, he has to drink Mm -hmm. the hemlock. And Jesus is saying, you know, please let this cup pass from me. And you realize like once you see enough of them, you maybe have to see a dozen or two dozen. But once you see enough of them, you're like, oh shoot, this isn't what I thought. And there's probably a lot more of this woven in. I'm yeah. curious if you're, you know, if you are curiously minded about it, I'm curious what else is in there. Cause there's a lot yeah. of stuff that they wove in and there it's, it's kind of like, I used the example the other day of like, if, if somebody 2000 years from now were to write a story about two guys fighting and um, one of them has a red sword and is wearing a mask mm-hmm. and the other guy's wearing a green sword and the guy with the green sword is the good guy. And the guy with the red sword is the bad guy. If you weren't, aware of it you wouldn't you'd miss the star wars analogy but if you have enough cultural sensitivity to know when they originally did it right you'd be like okay it's it's not the same story but i i see where you're copying from i see where you're getting these motifs from yeah and it's it's just it's amazing once you start down that path it's hard to stop because you're like i've been i've now got a primer i've got a primer to interpret it right yeah i mean literacy is an amazing thing (laughs) yeah Exactly. Especially too. I love the Homeric epics work that, the, you know, the Dennis McDonald's doing showing mm-hmm. how that's being been copied. So what, what was the final step? Like, like, how did you actually s- declare it? Did you say it to your, to just yourself privately? Did you tell your husband, like, how did you start to say I'm officially done? Yeah. You know, at that time we were watching a lot of videos. We had been watching, um, uh, um, we had been watching a lot of different people. We started watching like Holy Kool-Aid and we started watching um, Debate Squared. You know, okay. there's um, the one with Hitchens and, you know, is the Catholic Church a, um, you know, for good or worse, basically. Yeah. You know, so I started getting into those types of things. Um, started watching it and started seeing. Uh, that's when I started to realize like, Oh, there's so much cognitive dis- dissonance on the side of Christianity and the side of religions. And, um, you know, I just took, you know, when people say, oh, well, how can you not believe in God? Oh, well, there's just, we have so much proof that, you know, Jesus existed. And it's like, do we? Do we really? Can you list them? Can you, t- can you tell me that? You know, and then people will want to bring up the Shroud of Turin. It's like, no, all that proves is that there's a shroud with blood on it from around a similar date, or maybe not even that date. Uh, and how can we tie that to Christ? <laughs> like, uh, you got a big missing gap there, you know, or the Kalam cosmological argument. If you want to argue something from nothing, how could that possibly happen? It's just like, okay, but then go ahead and fill everything that it would take to get from, it had to be created to, it's my favorite God who did it. Um, there's a lot missing there. So I started Mm. watching stuff like that and it just kind of fell flat for me. Uh, I know my husband struggled with it a little bit more because of the idea that there was no afterlife and he struggled with that much more than I did. Um, You know, he's like, you really don't believe there's anything. And I'm like, I I don't think so. I don't think that there is, Um, you know, maybe there is, but I don't see evidence of it. And I don't see how the Bible would be any indicator that it, is true um based off of just all the fallacies and the contradictions in the bible and how all the things that have been changed and the things that we're not able to prove mm. um it's a myth just like anything else so mm. now you mentioned um before that you basically fully deconverted around the time of uh the, the mm-hmm. pandemic yeah what was your like was the experience of churches being closed a part of that or was it just an ironic timing? No, no, I wasn't going, I hadn't gone to a actual church since before, like I was in college. So at that point I had probably been out of church for four or five years, maybe, Um, you know, and I would get questions like, Oh, have you found a church up there? You know, like, and I had no, like, a, I am not a morning person. (laughs) And, I just, I wasn't interested in it. I enjoyed, you know, doing the, the yoga stuff. I enjoyed doing that kind of stuff, but I, I really didn't want to go to a church. And even when I was a Christian, once again, I believe like, um, 
me praying with God is just as good as me being, you know, in church with other believers and possibly better because I'm not distracted at the boy that I want to be dating, (laughs) you know, or something like that, possibly better. (laughs) So, you know, I just thought, "Eh, yeah, this is, you know, it's fine. Um, But no, it was just, we had so much time on our hands Um, at that time, right before the pandemic. I was a lash tech. And so I was up in people's faces applying lashes. And so I kind of knew that there was going to be a lockdown. And so I quit my job and I was like searching for, um, you know, remote work essentially. And so because I transitioned to a job where I was able to do remote work, I was also able to remotely work. And I had a job where I was able to just listen to stuff in the background, like 24 (laughs) seven. So I, that's what we did. And my husband did the same thing. He had like broke his arm around the time. So he wasn't even able to work. And so we were at home, like listening to stuff on the TV, sitting there together. So most of the time we were absorbing the same information. We were sitting down, watching it together, talking about things like, Oh, what do you think about that? Or, you know, I don't know. I like to kind of like like learn more about this. I don't quite understand that. Um, or I don't know if that's really relevant, what he's saying. Um, you know, we went back through watching movies, like terrible Christian movies, like fireproof and movie <laughs> movies like, um, Oh, I had, I cannot remember that guy's name, but there's the one where he said he claimed uh, Lee Strobel. He claims he's like, oh, I was an atheist. I was a hard earned atheist. And, you know, but then I had this experience and it convinced me. It's like, yeah, I don't really know if you really logic yourself out of that. You know, if you can't logic yourself out of something that you didn't logic yourself into. <laughs> so, um, mm. so yeah, we went back through that and kind of like, oh, wow, this is really bad. But when I was a Christian, this all just, I just took it for what it was. I agreed because that's like, yeah, that's how I've been raised. And that made sense to me. And I didn't feel a need to question at the time. Mm. You mentioned before that, um, you didn't feel the freedom to really be very public mm-hmm. with your extended family yeah. right away. Why was that? And and what was the fear factor? And when did you actually become public? And what has happened since you've done that? Yeah, so the becoming public, you know, I kind of became public about some of the woo stuff, like for our wedding, for instance, there. Um, yeah, there was definitely a part of the family that I didn't really want to come because our Luckily, we did our wedding out of state, so it kind of made it difficult for other people to come. And so it was limited and we didn't want kids there either because it was going to be a day service. It was not going to be one of these like party weddings. We wanted it small and we wanted it to be like the focus of like these are two people coming together to be married. This is about really the ceremony itself. But at the time we were into the woo stuff. So like we had crystals and we invoked the four elements and stuff like that. And so I knew that like, my parents are going to be exposed to this like the day of my wedding. (laughs) And so I kind of like dropped it on them. I had had conversations with my mom about some things, but I never came out and said like, I don't believe in God or I am, you know, I don't believe in Jesus or the way that like I grew up. I didn't say that for a very long time. But I kind of like gave these clues like, hey, you know, I'm practicing this. You know, you used to think like yoga was evil. Well, you know, I'm doing yoga and I'm doing these things. And, you know, I like shiny crystals and stuff like that. Um, So that was their first. That So I was I was 21 when I got married. Pretty young. And so that was the first time they were exposed to it. No one really said anything to me about it. Now, we did have a couple um, who was a part of a ceremony who was supposed to be handing out the crystals tell us they came all the way out of state. They knew what the job that we had given them to do, which was basically to hand out crystals and basically to tell everybody, hold the crystal and give your well wishes to the couple. And like that is going to hold the positive intentions of like your wishes for this couple. Um and then the night before when we're going through the run through she's she you know she stands up and she has her like christian moment of 
I'm a Christian and I just don't believe in these things. So we, my daughter and I will not be handing these things out. Um, you know, I cannot condone this. And it's like, you drove like eight hours to tell us this. You couldn't have told us this. Like <laughs> you could have just said, I don't feel comfortable with this, you know? Um, so, you know, there was some stuff like that. Um, I definitely have family on my mom's side who's much more religious, much more active in the church. And I had to hide that stuff for them. You know, there had been people that I'm like, I'm not even comfortable with those people being on my Facebook page. I'm not, you know, I had to block them. You know, I had done stuff like that. Um, and it kind of got to... Um, so I had come out, you know, like to my husband, to friends and stuff like that. I had kind of been talking about that, like over the pandemic, like I expressed that kind of stuff. I was open with his mom about some of that stuff because she's just a lot more easy to talk to. You know, she, um, you know, she calls herself a Christian um, and she says she believes, but I think she definitely believes because of the fear of like not being able to see people in the afterlife. So there's like, a, but in every other way, it's just like, is that the only reason you believe? <laughs> but so we had been open about that. I've been open up to other parts of his family. Um, but for my parents specifically, I think I gave you the date of like April of this year. Um, there was a movie that came out with Greg Locke and it was called like come out in Jesus name. I don't know if you had seen that or heard about that. I did. Yeah. Yeah. That's crazy stuff. <laughs> so my mom, you know, I um, mean, you know, I talked to her quite a bit and I called her. I was asking her what she was doing and she's like, oh, I'm going to go see this movie. And I was just thinking, wait, isn't that the movie with Greg Locke? You know, the the witches in my church guy, you know, like, oh, no. And so I was just thinking, like, holy cow, my mom is really like really tapping back into like the Pentecostal stuff or like that, the charismatic stuff. That's like our the baptist they you know they didn't speak in tongues they didn't talk about angels and demons really uh certainly not in like the main church like that might have been talked a little bit about in, like in youth uh, but it was more like the devil himself it was the one um and so when i heard her say that i was like oh my gosh like ugh, this is terrible and so uh, that was hard for me to hear and so i was like you know what I'm going to go watch the movie. So not because I believed in it, but because I wanted to have a conversation with her about it afterwards. She watched it. I went and watched it the next day, took notes on it, just like watching the whole thing, just like looking at, you know, like watching the insanity of that movie and just thinking like, this is like a denomination that's like rising in our country. Like, you know, like that's dropping in the Catholicism and more of the high church stuff those numbers are going down and we've got you know this emergence of this um the charismatics movement is like really booming especially like where i live and with trump like all of that just sh is shooting through the roof and i was like oh gosh and so yeah i i so then i called her i was like so what'd you think about the movie <laughs> and you know she's like oh i thought it was really good and I thought it touched on a lot of, you know, important subjects. And I think it's a good reminder to Christians that, you know, there are these forces out there and that even Christians ourselves can be like, um, you know, we can, um, you know, we can have demons in our own life. Now, mind you, in this movie, they're talking about like people like having a cold or like you have the demon of having a cold like no you're sick go to the doctor <laughs> like you know you don't need all this extra stuff you know and it's it's also just harmful it's just like no send your kid to the doctor you know or if you're having mental issues you, you know go ahead and check yourself in somewhere or get the help you need like there is more access to that stuff out there even with the healthcare system in America like you know there is <laughs> some more access to those types of things with like better help and like those types of companies. And so, yeah, we kind of talked about that and 
so I think I, I told you that my dad did not really come up from that type of stuff. He really wasn't into the charismatic stuff. And so at the time we were having this conversation, I did not know that my dad was in the background of when I was having the conversation with my mom and speaker. And he was like, wait, 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 what, what did this guy say? And so I started telling him like what this pastor said in this show and like what he thinks and like, you know, oh, you have the demon of nicotine, which my dad had used to like chew, chew, you used to do chewing tobacco. And it's like, do you have a demon dad? <laughs> you know, like, no, you have an addiction to nicotine, which is like, scientifically we understand this we can look at this and what kind of receptors are in the body that you know and so I know that threw him off because he did not go to watch this movie with my mom it was my mom alone and so I think that that like kind of weirded him out that she had watched this movie on the behest of a friend of hers who's really into that type of stuff anointing and oils and using all that kind of stuff who is a, a female pastor at some other charismatic church um, but yeah, I pretty much it kind of opened a whole can of worms up and as far as like, well, do you believe in this? Do you, you don't believe in hell? You don't believe in Satan? What do you mean? And kind of expressing some of those things. So it was, it was then that I kind of just like opened it all up <laughs> and I kind of laid it on the table for them. Did so, you actually use the word atheist or agnostic? Yeah. Um, you know, she asked, you know, like what I would have called myself. And I told her, I'm like, I would call myself an agnostic atheist. And the reason I say agnostic atheist is not to soften the blow of atheist, but because when I was a Christian and I know when, um, you know, when I was younger and I would have conversations, my mom, my mom was going to college. She had a friend who was agnostic and what she viewed agnostic was, is that you you just haven't really looked into it. You're a fence sitter, but we have the ability to save you. Now, if you're an atheist, that's just like, that's basically being a Satanist. There's probably no turning you away. And I think it's really important to like acknowledge, know that like agnostic means knowledge. It's saying, I do not have the knowledge of this God. And atheist means I do not have the belief in this God. So I have neither the belief nor the knowledge of this God, because I think Christians need to think about that when it's like, so, you know, we have Gnostic theists and agnostics. So technically everyone's an agnostic theist. <laughs> you can believe in it, but you don't have proof or, you know, you don't have the evidence of it. You don't really know. So mm. that's, you know, that's kind of what I, what I always, you know, talk about. Cause I know a lot of people are like, do you not call yourself, you know, just atheist because of that? I'm like, no, it's just to point out that like words have meanings and we should use them correctly. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Just curious, did they respond uh, with any level of respect or was there any sense of like, you know, we'll pray for you, but we still love you. Or was it, were you shunned at all? Um, I will say that like, I don't feel shunned at all by them. I, you know, I have it opened up to like the rest of my family and I don't really see a need to just because so much of them are older. Um, mainly I just have my grandmas around now and I, I just don't really see a need for that. Um, but for them, I think we, I mean, we had a long conversation that night as soon as I said like, yeah, no, I don't really believe in any of this. And, you know, and you always get these crazy questions like, well, then what's the point of life? What do you mean? Like, if you don't have, you know, the promise of a divine reward, life's not worth living. You can't like love your children and enjoy the time that you get to spend around people and, you know, travel and enjoy food. Like, aren't there other reasons from living than just like getting to praise endlessly, you know, at the Lord's feet for eternity, <laughs> you know? Like, please tell me, like, you care about other things than just that. Um, so, yeah, we had a long conversation. Um, my dad came, you know, he grew up around those areas, but because he was, um, you know, he grew up around Christianity and stuff like that. But because he was a military brat, he moved around a lot. So he did not have a church home. So it wasn't until he was like in his early 30s that he got saved and he was baptized in the same Pentecostal church that I got baptized in like a right around the same time. And so my dad was like, well, you know, when I was young, I struggled with it too. And, you know, but what it really came down 
to me, like besides all the crazy stories in the Bible and being able to believe that they were true or not, I just, you know, I couldn't see how something came from nothing, and which of course that's a misnomer. Um, but it's like just logic, you know, logical fallacies are not taught in schools like they should. Um, you know, and I think that the vastness of eternity, the vastness of space is so uncomprehensible for people like even just um even just for people trying to understand um you know savings uh, what is that called um savings over time you know if you're putting more money into your social security over time knowing how much it will invest and in, like um what is that called um the compound interest yes com- yeah compound yeah understanding just that itself like people do do not aren't able to conceptualize even a hundred, you know, a hundred year lifespan and like what money saving now in your twenties will do for you when you're ready to tire versus if you start saving in your thirties or your forties. So of course it's um, incomprehensible for someone to understand what eternity would it be like and to understand that something has existed potentially for all eternity and that there wasn't one beginning. Um, But once again, it's the you know, that goes back to the clum, um, you know, turtles all the way down. Like if there was one God who created him, you're so you can understand the concept of him existing forever, but not the earth existing forever or, you know, space existing. Um, so that was kind of his argument of just saying, you know, like, I just don't see how something could come from nothing. And, you know, the, like the finely fine tune argument. Um, and so, but just like over the years, I've come to learn about those types of fallacies and learn about, um, you know, different um, epistemology and um, just the different arguments for God. And they're all pretty easily rebutted. (laughs) So, and yeah, so that's pretty much what it came down to. And, um, you know, my mom sent me some stuff. She sent me some things that she thought I might find interesting, but I, at that point, I just, they definitely weren't prepared to be able to have a conversation with me because I had been deconstructing really over a very long period of time. Like I've already looked this up. I've already, like, I know what logical fallacy you're, you're falling into right now. And it's kind of one of those things where like my husband was with me right there watching those videos with me, you know, to be able to really absorb all that knowledge. It takes time to dig yourself out of something and to get over the fear of hell. Um, and so I didn't, I, you know, I don't expect them to be able to do that overnight or maybe even in a year. Um, but um, yeah, I mean, that that's kind of where it came, it, what it came to is just having conversations and I'm open to having conversations with them. Um, I think I told you that, you know, um, originally I had to cancel because I, I had to go see them. They were, they're moving to DC. And so, um, you know, I went down to go visit them and, you know, I don't, I don't bring anything up unless they want to talk about it. I'm completely happy to talk about it. I don't feel threatened by it. And, you know, like I'll, I'll share like what I know and if they have questions, you know, I'll, I'll give, but I guess at the end of the day, they, sh- the, they would have a fear of me going to hell versus me. If, I don't think you're going to go to anywhere, even if you don't believe the right thing. <laughs> I think maybe you're just wasting some Sundays, you know, so, and, mm. and money anytime you donate, but um, yeah. It's amazing to me too, how some of the questions that people have, like, how can there be, why is there something rather than nothing? And where did it all come from? How did it get here? those questions are so good and they're part of what we all naturally tend to go to. But it's so weird to me that so many Christians just connect the dots that you were mentioning before. Like there has to be some explanation for it. Therefore Yahweh and Jesus, like number one, how do you know it's not many gods? (laughs) And number two, how do you know it's your God? And number three, why are you ignoring the fact that you're the God stories you're clinging to mm-hmm. are so heavily copied from other God stories that came earlier, but you're, you're writing them all off, even though they evolved from them. Yeah. Um, you know, J- Judaism heavily evolved from Egyptian mythology mm-hmm. and ancient Sumerian mythology. Christianity evolved from all those as well as Greco-Roman mythology and some, some influences from other places. Mm-hmm. It's like, 
all these stories and some of them are very similar and some of them are like almost identical. And we'd all say that's all pretend, that's all mythology, that's all pagan religion. But ours, it looks so close to it and so clearly copied from some of it yeah. is is somehow the right one. And yeah. I've never, I know that when you're in it, you just think we know because we know because we know. <laughs> but it's once you're out, it's it's kind of cool. Once you're out, you kind of get a, the freedom to open your eyes a little bit to think what what would this have looked like if I hadn't ever been stuck in it, even though I can reflect on what it was like to be in it. Now mm -hmm. that I'm out, I can kind of begin to have eyes to see what this would have looked like to me had I been always an atheist. Mm -hmm. And when you look at it, it just looks so ridiculous. The claims to connect, I, I need an answer for the mysteries of the universe, therefore mm -hmm. Yahweh. They just, yeah. they truly don't connect in any sense. It's, yeah. and it, it, it really helps in some ways to me the bizarreness of connections like that to mm -hmm. say, I need to, I need to have some answer to the mysteries of life there for Yahweh and Jesus. The fact that Christians connect those things and, and see those connections as in any way valid mm -hmm. helps me to see, yeah, they're, they're so blinded. Yeah. And I've said this before a long time ago, but you know, if you have a mythological worldview, you have completely disengaged from rationality. Yeah. And so the idea of what makes sense here is no longer an option for discussion. You you have basically disqualified yourself from rational thinking if you think yeah. with a mythological worldview. And so the idea of what, how how are you doing this mentally? It's like it doesn't matter. They've disqualified themselves. The yeah. the hoops that they have to jump through don't make sense. They never made sense. So to ask them from my mm -hmm. perspective, why how is this making sense to you? It doesn't matter. It's it's not going to make sense. Because yeah. it's 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 the out, outgrowth of what a mythological worldview does, not just the actual core mythological worldview, but the fact that a mythological worldview distorts your ability to see reality so badly yeah. that you're just you know you're just walking in the dark blindly at, at all these questions and just kind of fling you know fl throwing darts and hoping you're going to hit the dartboard somewhere, mm -hmm. and you're not you're not even going to get close, and yet ironically that's where they think that they've got the one answer even though they're the furthest away from it. And yeah. it's it's really helped me to see too the danger of doing this to kids because it isn't just the idea of, well, you've just told kids that they're responsible for you know a man being tortured and, and that they deserve <laughs> he deserved to be tortured to pay their penalty, which they deserved in the first place. It's not just all that stuff about atonement and and God's judging you, that bad stuff and the danger of hell. It's that you're you're priming the pump for them to see, see things that aren't there. You're priming yeah. them to see, um, you know, angels and demons flying around the room. You're priming them, you know, if not physically to see it, at least emotionally, mm -hmm. you're priming them to take reality. And, and when they see real science to reject it because it doesn't fit in the ways that this stuff messes with your mind. I mean, it, it's basically like, it, as, as other people have said forever, it's like a drug. And, and once you start taking it, it it distorts your ability to perceive things for the for real, yeah. and that's where the scariness comes in. And that's why I, I feel like it's it's not too much of a stretch to say this stuff when you do it to kids is psychological child abuse. Um, even yeah. if even if you don't give them the whole, well, you're going to burn in hell if you don't believe like me. Even if you keep that stuff out of it, mm -hmm. you're still messing with their minds on so many horrible levels, and it it breaks my heart. It really does. Yeah, it struck me as very odd when I would um you know propose these questions of like where you know can you fill in these gaps for me because i'm not able to with what i've gathered and kind of um coming to the conclusion of like well i just have to have faith you know i try not to ask those questions you know you know nobody really knows you know we can't know these things and it's just like but there's the threat of hell so if you really believe this, like, and there's hells in other religions, so how do you know you're not going to hell in some other religion, which is kind of what I went through before the, you know, the actual deconversion of Christianity, um, you know, because I had that fear. I just could not fathom how someone did not care enough to ask the questions and to do the research and to just like pick up the book they say that they believe in and to read it to front, you know, front to back and, you know, put it in a contextual history to get a keyword Bible study, um, a Bible that shows you the Hebrew and the Greek and to not understand that like, oh, Gehenna, hell, you know, you know, trash pit, you know, all different things here. Um, you know, like, 
I didn't I I just could not conceive how someone could just be like, oh, I don't know. Ho hopefully it all works out for me in the end. <laughs> you know, I just I couldn't I was I had too many questions to just uh, hope that it would work out. And I think a lot of it. I think a lot of it, sadly, like I said, I think it just equips people to deal with the reality of death and not being able to see loved ones after life because I've had, you know, conversations with other, um, you know, like with his mom, my husband's mom. And, you know, she just says, you know, like, I just can't imagine, you know, like not being able to see, you know, like my father or loved ones. And I'm just like, you know, that's so, so sad because I lost a grandpa when I believed and then I lost a grandpa after I was already out of it. And it, even though I was a little close, I was, I was a little closer to the one who I lost, um, after I believed it was so much easier to process that because it wasn't like, why did Jesus take him now? Like, why could he have done this? Or all, there were all these signs, like, you know, like life just became so much more simple of like not having to do all these different backflips and, you know, did I pray right? Or did I say this that was wrong? You know, like life just becomes so much more simple when you're not having to contort everything to fit into the mythological worldview of Christianity. Yeah, very well said. And I, I don't know if you did this, I think you'd probably agree to this, but it's amazing too, once you leave, and you really sit back and reflect on it, like the arguments stop of, is it really real? Did Jesus really resurrect? Did, did he really mm -hmm. walk on water? You know, is there, is the Bible really inerrant? Just, once you step away from it all and you're like, I'm, I'm out, I'm like, I'm done. And you really get a chance to kind of do a mental post-mortem. At least for me, it was like, this was ridiculous. Like I felt stupid. Like I should have seen this is, I believed in a God who likes to mutilate little boy's genitals. Mm -hmm. I believed in a God who couldn't just say, I forgive you. He had to have blood. Like I believed in a, in a, in a, in a organized religion where we proactively did the symbolic eating of Jesus's blood and, and, mm -hmm. and drinking his blood and eating his body. Like this stuff is really weird and it's really yeah. stupid. And once you step back, you're like, what the hell was I in? And that, that mentality that when you're a Christian, you think they're a cult, they're a cult, they're a cult their cult you're like mm -hmm. oh shit i was in a cult it was yeah. just there was a lot more people in it so it was more widely acceptable but mm -hmm. just because a lot more people accept a cult doesn't make it not a cult yeah. i was in a cult i was a cult leader in a sense in the sense of anytime i was preaching with them and cheering them on and doing leadership like i was involved in a cult mm -hmm. and once you step out you're like this is so I mean, it's like it's sad but you also laugh you're like what the hell? Why, why couldn't I see this? This is so obvious. It's so obvious that Christianity is one of the stupidest worldviews you could ever embrace. Mm -hmm. To think that there's a God out there that's going to burn everybody if you don't believe in his son's magic blood. Like, come on. This is yeah. a human sacrifice death cult. Yeah, We are stuck in something really weird. And I, I know people grieve over leaving mm -hmm. Christianity. I, I guess I did my grieving in part before I left. But when I left, I was like, I won the lottery. I feel so mm -hmm. happy that I've got at least a little bit of time left to live my real life and to figure out what I really want to do with it. Right. And, and you know, to give my kids a better chance at, at, at escaping this stuff. But once you leave, like you can't, it's a, it's a cliche that we all keep saying, but once you see it, you can't unsee it. It's like, I, I you couldn't pull me back. It's mythology. Mm -hmm. And I, I, I feel so bad for the people that are stuck in it and they just, they want so bad to pull you back in and mm -hmm. you know from your side you're like it's it's like it's not even on the radar like it's you couldn't suck me back in you might as well tell me to believe in dionysius this yeah. stuff and you literally are actually trying to get and at me least to i get a wine with that one you know <laughs> yeah exactly but it's 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 crazy it's a crazy ride um i know i've asked you a lot of questions we've kind of gone over time but in terms of just wrapping up did you have any words you would give of advice to someone who's gone through some similar stuff and is either on the fence of, of coming out publicly and saying, yeah, I'm actually out or is struggling with just the fear of what people are going to think if they, if they express these doubts mm -hmm. um, or they know there's some real big pushback that could be coming their way. What would you say to somebody that's, that's just, they, they, they know enough to know that they can't go back 
and they can't get plugged back in the matrix as we say but they also know that life's about to change and it could be very painful if they get vocal how would you advise them to to start that process well even i think when you feel like you know i don't think that there's anything wrong with reminding yourself and educating yourself more and and further by picking up some of the greats, some of the great mythologies and reminding yourself that, yeah, this, this is a mythology, just like the other mythology. Um, because s- sad enough to say, it's kind of like, you know, it does such a crazy thing to your mind that it, we're like little kids where you have to spray under the bed for monsters in a way, because we've been hardwired to believe this, these things. So I think once again, educating yourself about those types of things, finding a community, whether that's the atheist community or a humanist group, or even the like a street epistemology community is really cool. That's when I've started to look into more, um, you know, street epistemology goes into not just, you know, religious beliefs, but all different types of belief. And are you being logical when, you know, do you have sound epistemology? Do you have good reasons for believing in what you believe? And, you know, because so many people believe things and they want to push them on to other people. They want to pass laws based on those beliefs. And when those things aren't sound and they're based off of myths, you know, we're doing the world a disservice. So I, I would say those things. Um, and yeah, bring back the reading list. You know, there's no reason to stop once you get out of high school, you know, NPR has a great, um, great list. They, um, put out, um, you know, the books that changed the world. And so um, one of the first like atheist books I really read was Hitchens on Thomas Paine, The Rights of Man. And I picked that up because that was during Trump. That was, you know, during the whole like, you know, Trump, you know, America is a Christian religion type of thing. Um, And I wanted to educate myself on that. And like, I always felt that, no, I think that there's pretty clearly a separation of, you know, religion and state. But let me just, you know, check this. Um, you know, there's everyone would be a little bit better off if we had a sound epistemology on all things. Mm. Well said, well said. Well, um, just want to say, number one, I'm so glad you got out. Of course, that's the big picture is always so glad you escaped. Um, and also I'm so glad that you've been able to start to get vocal. Um, we've definitely, I try to acknowledge that there are times for people to not be vocal, whether it's because of the country they live in or, you know, they're going to lose their job or whatever. There's times to, you know, to, to speak up very slowly and kind of stay under the radar for a while. I'm so glad you felt the freedom to be more vocal. And I'm glad you were able to do that. I love that you're sharing your story here today and I'm sure you'll be um, doing that more, but just want to say too, um, thank you for, for being willing to entertain my questions about the whole journey. Cause I, I feel like everybody's path is a little different and I really do like to figure out where people are coming from. And some of the ways that your journey evolved is definitely different from my journey, what I'm used to hearing, but it's interesting. It's really interesting to hear it. And I will admit too, I, um, I've never believed in like the power of crystals, but I've always just, mm-hmm. I've just always just wanted to collect them. Like I love, the little, look don't them. worry. I don't believe in them now. <laughs> if you want a crystal, I'll ship them to you. Cause I've got plenty of them. <laughs> I, I love just the, you know, the, 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 the look of them and, mm-hmm. uh, and the sparkling and so forth, but you know, it's, it's really cool to hear it. And I'm so glad that you're being able to share with your family. I'll be really curious. I would love to to touch base with you. It's, you know, maybe whatever in a year or two and just see how did that, that evolve? Did you get a chance to share with them the, the fact that this is in fact mythology where they're willing to listen? Cause in many ways that's, that's kind of the next big step on so many, so many of our radars is saying now that we've left, mm-hmm. it's like, we realized this was a prison are we willing to help other people also escape this mental prison? So I'll be curious how that evolves in your, in your journey. And if, if they're willing to listen at all, but I know in my journey, um, almost everyone is just not willing to listen. They, I mean, it's not like they listen and say, I reject what you're saying. Yeah. They don't care. They don't want to know, <laughs> yeah. which is pretty crazy to me. Yeah. It's definitely run, run by fear a lot. And yeah, yeah that, that, that helped to me get out is by realizing that so much of this was driven by fear. Mm. Um, yeah, absolutely. Well, we've been speaking with Leanne Miller. Leanne, thank you so much for sharing. It's great to get to hear you, your story, and thank you so much for sharing today. Thanks, Tim. Thank you.